Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report, Susan Barrett. Yes, and happy St. Patrick's Day to all. Um, I just have a couple of scheduling updates and some reminders on public comments. I'll start with the scheduling. Just a reminder that this evening, the board uh, will be um, the primary care advisory group, uh, a um, technical advisory group of the board will be meeting at 5 p.m. And that um, meeting information is on our website. Public is welcome to attend as well. And then um, just in terms of public comment, we still are accepting public comment on a potential next agreement with our, the federal government. And um, we will share those comments with our partners at AHS. Uh, as they will be leading that effort on that potential next agreement. Um, I apologize for the whining dog in the background. Um, and uh, the Patrick Rooney will be going over some of the public comment that re we received for the hospital budget guidance, but we continue to accept public comment on that as well. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, March 10th. Is there a motion? So, so moved. moved. Second. It's, second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, March 10, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the minutes uh, were approved unanimously. And with that, we're going to uh, turn the meeting over to the health system finance team led by Patrick Rooney as we move through and start to make decisions on this year's hospital budget guidance. So, Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, good afternoon board and members of the public and stakeholders, happy St. Patrick's Day. We're all Irish today. I apologize for no green. My wife turned down a green suit a couple of years ago and I've been living with the shame ever since. So I'm wearing my, my lucky wedding day tie instead. Just <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna kick off today, uh, March 17th with the second meeting in yeah. what is it what, what is it what is three 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 meeting hold um <clears throat> i will move this to reading view for everyone and if we could get everyone who's not speaking to put themselves on mute um there was a little bit of a feedback there so maybe that will correct that thank you mr chair so we're gonna start off with a similar look as we did last meeting, as we sit here in meeting number two of the three meetings we have set forth. Um, these are not by all means concrete at this stage, um, and we will adjust these as needed if we move through today and um, we need another meeting on top of the March 24th hold that we currently have. Um, so this is the roadmap for now. It could change based on today's discussion. <clears throat> And picking up where we left off from last week, as Susan mentioned, we did receive some public comment. We wanted to acknowledge the receipt of those from the folks on the screen, Dale Hackett, Gifford Medical Center, UVM Health Network, uh, Vaz, and the Healthcare Advocate. And we'll touch on a couple of these as we go through. There was some, uh, we wanted to acknowledge some of these items, specifically Vaz, um, we wanted to or I wanted to apologize for not mentioning this at the last meeting, but they had sent a letter to the Green Mountain Care Board on, I believe it was February 5th, asking for a suspended or significantly stripped down budget process. And their uh, letter received on March 15th reinforced um, the feeling and perspective of them and their members on those topics. So we wanted to acknowledge that that was out there. <clears throat> uh, with the UVM Health Network, we did receive some feedback on the financial appendices, and we took some of that into consideration, and we'll talk about what we did there. And the healthcare advocate sent over some public comment, which was um, two parts. Part of it was public comment for the board's uh, 
consideration in guidance, and the other one was um, their input for this year's guidance process. <clears throat> and we'll talk about that as we navigate. So we have a few changes, as I discussed, to the hospital budget guidance and appendices. So bear with me as I toggle back and forth. Some of that feedback was from board members at the last meeting we had on March 10th. And some of uh, the remainder was from a, some of the UVM Health Network um, uh, proposed changes in their public comment, which we thought might add clarity to the documents that we've produced and presented here. So with that, I'll start with the hospital budget guidance. And for those of you following at home, I am on slide four right now. <clears throat> So with the guidance, the one part that we um, added to here, <clears throat> as we posted on our website, was a little deeper line of questioning on page 10 of the guidance. And that came about from board member Pelham, who wanted to understand a little bit more about certain aspects of the progress of um, value-based healthcare reform here in Vermont. So. Elena Berry, be the director of healthcare policy, was kind enough to work with Tom to craft some of these questions, which we've included in the guidance. Um, so we hope the board will consider the addition of those when approving the hospital budget guidance. But for those at home who may not be able to see my screen, I'll read each of those uh, to you. And the, the question number one that's been added was, what is the tipping point or threshold defined as the percentage that true FVP comprises of total NPR FVP? necessary to support the successful transformation of your delivery system to a system substantially based on value-based care. The second line of questioning was assuming Medicare and Vermont commercial payers offer a true actuarially sound population-based fixed payment tomorrow. Over what time horizon would you estimate you could reach your local tipping point? How long would it take your hospital to move operationally to a mostly fixed budget through participation in all payer fixed payment programs? And finally, <clears throat> What would the Medicare and commercial fixed payment programs need to look like to facilitate your participation? So those are the items that we've added to the budget guidance document <clears throat> outlining the board's expectations for the FY22 fiscal year. And the other, the other additions occurred in the appendices or the financial workbook. <clears throat> so UVM's feedback that we accepted um, dealt with a lot of house cleaning items on here that they felt would help clarify and offer a fuller perspective of the ask that we have here. So last week, these payer columns here on line 10 only contained Medicare, Medicaid, and total commercial. So with their feedback, we added total self-pay and other and DISH. And down on the vertical axes, we aligned this section here with what is being done down below in table three, which is the projected to budget look. So we made some of those minor changes there. Um, in the past, we've had these payer fields um, more detailed. We were trying to streamline that down. But if the case is that we're um, actually impacting the story being told by trying to be um, too streamlined, then we'd rather have it be um, built out to where it, it provides a better perspective for the board. and. Um, is a clear understanding for the hospitals of how to populate this document. And this is more in line with years past by bringing out DISH and total self-pay other um, in addition to commercial Medicaid and Medicare. <clears throat> so we did accept the request to make those changes. Um, we also on appendices number one, we linked the inflation increases from the inflation tab to this tab here for ease of use. Um, this will now populate based on the response that comes in here in dollars. So again, we're looking for the price effect. Nothing on the inflation tab has changed. It's just going to drag that price effect, as we've noted here, <clears throat> into this spreadsheet. So with that, uh, we've also uh, made some changes to Appendix 2, and we clarified some of the language up here. We still had some language talking about um, gross charge, et cetera. We changed that to gross revenue based on this increase in, consi in considering utilization assumptions and acuity. It really, what we weren't being as clear as we could be. So we accepted their 
um, <clears throat> their input on that as well. So those are the changes that we made to this spreadsheet here. Um, they offered some other input as well, but seeing as how we need to regulate 14 hospitals, some of those discussions really should involve more stakeholders than just UVM. And I don't believe it was their intent that we consider all of these, uh, all of this feedback. It was simply the fact that they wanted the opportunity to provide feedback and, and we allowed that. And we brought some of that in here without making too many substantive changes to the workbook we presented last week. So like I said, most of it was house cleaning um, to be taken care of. <clears throat> Uh, finally, whoops, I navigated too soon. We made a change to the COVID page here. Uh, board member Yusufer had asked that we include a uh, Paycheck Protection Program funds line explicitly, so we've done that. And we also added columns to each one of these fiscal years here for amounts received. So there will be, these are subtotals of what's been received, which will add back into this grand total here, but now we'll see in each year how much you've received, how much you've recognized in revenues, and how much you've recorded in a liability. Now, we didn't break any of these down into subtotals based on um, grants and advances or what you got to pay back and what you don't, because as we've heard over the last couple of weeks, that federal guidance around grants continues to change and folks may end up having to pay back, we don't know yet, some of those funds. So we didn't want to take that any farther on on that line of thinking. We think we've captured um, most of what we need right here with the additions that um, board member Yusufer provided us last week. So those are the changes to <clears throat> the budget guidance document and appendices from last week to update everybody at home. Next, <clears throat> we've updated some discussion points. Uh, some of the big ones that we're gonna have here today are uh, based on the board's request that the staff um, bring some uh, varying looks to uh, potential discussion on NPR FPP growth ceiling. We've done that with a recommendation by staff. Uh, the board also requested that we bring a um, some change in charge perspective to the discussion today with a recommendation, and we've done that. And then there's a potential that the board could vote on the standing enforcement policy that legal presented last week. There's been no changes there. And then the discussion around exemption from public hearing. So we'll have a discussion on that today uh, and potential vote should the board feel comfortable with the direction we're headed. Um, and we've come up with a recommendation for that, but there'll be, a, there'll be an in-depth discussion around how that might look. Uh, and finally, we have the healthcare advocate input. Uh, they had not yet sent anything over as of last week, and we did not expect them to. But today we have their feedback from uh, yesterday with their input and items for consideration for the board. <clears throat> so I'm actually going to jump to that, and then we can move through the NPR charge enforcement and exemption discussion. But we want to acknowledge the healthcare advocates' um, items that they sent over to us um yesterday so <clears throat> at the top of their document there's two bullet points um, for public comment and board consideration and number one says please describe to the best of your knowledge any other potential COVID-19 relief funds that your hospital could receive the factors involved and whether or not you'll receive these funds and the current status of the funding process so they're asking us to add this as additional request to um, the narrative section of the budget guidance. So we ask you to consider that. <clears throat> and then in the second bullet point, they're urging the board to specify how hospitals should calculate each reported data element to help ensure the meanings of the hospital's responses are fully transparent and standardized amongst other language below. And the staff feel that we already do this. We offer a uniform reporting manual. We have an adaptive user guide. Um, and all of these organizations operate under generally accepted accounting principles, which transfer to their um, audited financial statements. So we feel that we've done an adequate job at standardizing these. And as finance folks, we operate under generally accepted accounting principles. So we 
we we do not urge the board to adopt that piece. We think we do it already, and <clears throat> generally accepted accounting principles do allow for a standardized approach in reporting. And the hospitals all understand how we gather um, metrics uh, through our reporting. So we feel that we're doing a pretty solid job of that now. So in addition to that, the uh, healthcare advocate is asking that <clears throat> These items here, reimbursement ratio relative to standardized Medicare reimbursement be added. I'm touching on broad topics here. Uh, hospital financial assistance and bad debt during COVID-19, along with some support information for that, that request. Medicaid screening processes and some um, perspective for that request as well. And then finally, um, a discussion from the hospitals on any analysis or tracking your hospital conducts or is considering conducting regarding access to care, care efficacy, or satisfaction among vulnerable populations, including but not limited to a group below um, that line. So <clears throat> we uh, request the board consider those items for this year's hospital budget guidance. And with that, I will move into the NPR and FPP growth ceiling discussion. And Mr. Chair, just to clarify, do you want me to hold after each one of these so the board can discuss, or would you like me to navigate my way through this entire presentation and then we can come back to these individual items? I would prefer to take up uh, one chunk at a time. So I was hoping that uh, at this point we could hear from the healthcare advocate on why they're asking for this information and then take public comment and uh, possibly have a vote and put this one section behind us. Because I think if we try to focus on everything, we're just going to go back and, and ask similar questions again. So um, if that's okay with you, that would be my preference. Absolutely. That makes sense to me. So um, I'm not sure if Mike's on the line or Eric or Kay Kaylee, but um, could you just... Um, Give us a, a brief uh, review of um, why you think these are important. I have to tell you that um, my opinion is that um, you, the healthcare advocate has the right under statute to ask for whatever they want to ask for. And in my view, it would be much better to ask up front than make the hospital scramble at the end. So um, I understand uh, um the need very much so to make this process as easy as possible, given the difficult times that the hospitals are under. But I, I do think that uh, we owe the respect to the healthcare advocate to hear them out. And again, whatever we don't adopt into guidance, I still believe they have the right at hearing to ask again. So um, with that, I'm not sure, Mike, are you on the line or, or who is? I am on the line, thank you. Kevin, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mike Fisher here. Um, and so I am also going to ask my team to chime in as I get it wrong or incomplete. <laughs> but um, in the first section, um, yes, our intent here in the first bullet was just to get the best knowledge possible, not only of uh, monies that they anticipate or feel, you know, we had a little fear that the term anticipated could lead someone to a, a hospital to say, well, we're not sure, so we're not reporting it. So just to get as full a picture as possible. In the second bullet, um, um, we continue to look for as much as possible apples to apples comparisons. And uh, it's true that there is, uh, uh, you know, that, that hospitals and the board ask for generally acceptable accounting principles. Um, but that doesn't uh, it's not uncommon that we hear various entities say we've reported based on, you know, according to acceptable accounting principles that still don't align with each other. Um, and so we, we continue to ask for uh, as much clarity as possible. And I, I, I fully respect and understand uh, the perspective that your staff just said. Um, there's a, a great deal of effort and a great deal of improvement that's gone towards this. Uh, we, we continue to find uh, particular areas where we, we don't feel like we can compare hospitals. Uh, I'm going to pause for a second and ask if a member of my team has something to add to that. 
I just wanted to say on the data definition issue that um, I, I fully agree that, you know, gap or an audited statement does not ensure um, that it's apples to apples, um, that there's very problematic leeway in that. And I don't think it's the same. This I do want to note that we put this in a letter to the board um, and Susan has said we're going to have a work group uh, on that. And so we did, we do note that. And I think it's really about a rather than a improving this year, because it's a huge task that the process and the stakeholder engagement start and not during this, the, this moment of crisis, but as soon as possible thereafter. So it was really just a to put this issue before the board again, rather than saying uh, this is something that should be incorporated this year. Kevin, do you want me to comment on the next sections? Yes, please, Mike. So I, for, for the questions, I think maybe it's one through four, um, you know, these are the questions that we came up with. Um, I, I do want to note, I don't know who's driving, but if you could go right to the very bottom. Um, um, just our invitation to, um, to hospitals that, um, uh, that if there's any concern about, I, I, we want to be sensitive to the crisis that's going on. We're attempting to be sensitive with the, the, the number of questions and the details of questions um, that we've asked during this time. Um, but we want to project just as loudly as can be that we're, uh, we're, while we are interested in getting the answers to these questions, we are also interested in working with hospitals and don't want to be un provide an unreasonable burden. And so we are happy to work with hospitals to uh, figure out a way to get to, to bridge those those two interests. So from the hospital perspective, I'd like to take any uh, public comment uh, um, as much as possible on areas that you think um, could be too um, burdensome or um, hard to do given the current climate. And uh, I don't know if Jeff Tiemann, you're going to speak on behalf of all the hospitals. I notice there's a lot of hospital CEOs on the line and CFOs, um, but basically I'll take public comment from anybody and in, in their feedback on uh, what is being proposed from the healthcare advocate. Um, Chair Mullen, this is Mike Del Treco. Hey, Mike. I'm trying to get my video going. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, um, I appreciate the healthcare advocates recognition of some of these challenges uh, that we're facing. Um, I certainly will continue to work with them offline. I've offered that and and uh, their their team and staff has acknowledged a, a little bit of of uh, a hold on until after this process is done. Um, I would just ask the general question as I ask all the time, of of what value do are these things uh, to the budget process themselves, and if it should be outside of the process, um, that would you know because where it does may or may not impact the budget process, that'd be uh, good to know. And um, I would rather work on these outside of the budget process while as, as instead of inside the budget process. Thank you. Would that go for all of the questions that the healthcare advocate has asked, Mike? Um, you know, I looked at all of these and uh, the other day, and and when when I received them, I, I just um, you know, for example, ratio of inpatient reimbursement to Medicare reimbursement standard by MSD relative weights. Um, like, what are you going to do with that? I guess. Um, and and so it would be yes outside of the budget process to all of them. Mike Fisher, is that uh, anything that uh, um, your team would uh, like to consider as far as working with Mike and representatives from the hospitals to uh, do this outside of the process, or would you prefer that it be inside the process? I, I think 
I, I'm happy to talk with Mike and the hospital association in any particular hospital about how to do it right. Um, I, I just want to recognize the the dynamic. You know, we have a right to ask questions in the hospital budget process. You're offering to, you know, and asking us to do it outside the hospital budget process. I know that uh, hospitals and and the hospital association is uh, is doing what it needs to do to put out fires every day, uh, real fires. Um, and that um, uh, sometimes good intentions are hard to follow through on um, uh, as we as we manage this, the pressures on all of our jobs. So having said all of that, recognizing all those pressures, um, um, you know, we're happy to continue to have this conversation and, and figure out the best way to get answers to the questions. OK, and, and realizing that you're really not giving up the ability to still ask these, the hospitals are just giving up the ability to do it in advance um, if you still proceed with it. Um, I think both sides would work in good faith and uh, recognize the situation that everybody is in. So um, I guess my recommendation at this point is if the two parties are agreeable that we not make it part of the uh, um, guidance and allow the parties a chance to uh, work through uh, the discussion. Is there any board member that feels contrary that uh, um, we should not follow that process? This is Robin. I, th I think that makes sense to me. I would leave it up to them, although I will note that question one, which around the standardized Medicare reimbursement is helpful to me in setting the change in charge. So out of the questions, that would be the one that uh, would be helpful to me during the pot in the process. Um, the other questions I are interesting and have in interesting information around what's going on in COVID. So I don't want to minimize the other questions. I just, for me personally, one is the the first one is actually helpful in the process. So I just wanted to make note. But if people want to take that offline this year, I'm happy to be flexible. Other board members? Um, Kevin, I would agree with Robin that I think one is helpful in the budget process. I think the other ones, if there is a movement to move them offline, uh, I would support that. Outside of the budget process, I think so. Yeah, I think we should include one in the budget process as well. And the others could be outside. Would somebody think... like to make a motion and then we'll just continue with the discussion? Sure, that's as the official motion maker. <laughs> um, I move that uh, we include uh, the healthcare advocate question number one in the hospital budget guidance and uh, leave the remaining questions to the parties uh, to work through a process. Is there a second? I'll second it. And Tom, I, I think I might have cut you off. Did you have something to uh, to say? No, I, I think Robin's perspective um, is a fair one. And, uh, you know, we'd all like to have everything that we could have. But but, the, you know, the uh, um, the pressures that hospitals are under, I think that we have to work for it as hard as we can to keep it, keep it at a minimum this year. Um, so um, I thought Robin's perspective was a fair one. OK, other board members, any uh, further discussion? I'm going to open it up for public comment before the vote again. Um, but board discussion first. Hearing none, I'll open it up for public comment from anyone. Kevin, Mike Fisher again. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I, I, I guess. Uh, um, I appreciate that recognition of question one. Um, we were motivated to, we have been motivated to ask it for some time, but we've also noted the, uh, uh, some board members' interest in, um, uh, in that question. Um, and so that, that, uh, that makes sense. And, um, and I, I'll just, um, I'll just emphasize again that uh, we do have a right to ask questions and we uh, are doing our very best to be responsive 
to the pressures on the hospitals. So we'll we'll find we'll continue to find the best balance we can on that. Mike, I know you and your office have always uh, understood the gravity of the situation, and um, you were great last year. And I assume that uh, this year will be no different. And uh, you know, we appreciate all the members of the Green Mountain Care Board, the hard work that the Healthcare Advocates Office is doing every day. So thank you for uh, your understanding in this. Does anyone else have any other public comment? I see a hand up from, uh, doo -doo -doo. Mark Stanislaus. Hi, Kevin. Uh, the only thing I would share is census information was just thrown at us this morning um, uh, and in this meeting. Um, I would advocate for even under Mike Dautreco's approach for this one. I don't even know if we can provide the data that's in that right hand side of the column, um, even if we wanted to. So, so you know, um, uh, so I don't know how to respond under public comment for something that you don't think you can provide to to begin with. But so, I mean, I would advocate well the approach with that Voss put out there, um, at least for this year on these types of questions. Thank you, Mark. And I'm sure that uh, even if this motion does pass, that you can have those conversations in that work group with the healthcare advocate. And uh, if you can't do it, you can't do it. But at this point, um, uh, is there I, any other? Is, is, is that, I don't even think we could provide that second column for all of those payers. So, I mean, I just wanted the board to know that. Uh, I mean, to put something in the guidance that knowingly hospitals can't provide um you know um that's up to the board's call but you know since this was just thrown at us and you know it would be great to have more time to react to something than this hey. other that's public comments other public comment Robin, based on uh, uh, the comments you heard, is there any uh, um, amendment to your motion or are you staying with it as is? Well, so I'm, I certainly am sensitive to, uh, we did get something, I didn't go back and compare how this question is asked this year compared to last year. So, um, but this is information that was in the questions last year or similar, I should say, information was in the questions last year. Um, So I'm just wondering, like certainly it doesn't necessarily make sense to include something that people can't answer. Um, so I'm wondering if it would make sense either to put this in as a placeholder and then, I mean, it's kind of a pain to revise the guidance or um, I don't know, come back to this. I don't know if next week is enough time for people to come up with a question that makes sense to both of them. But so yeah, Kevin, I just I want to stress that guidance is strictly that it's the guidance. And, uh, um, you know, I don't think that uh, anybody should get too worried about uh, specific language in the guidance, because if there is a sea change that happens between now and the submission of the budget process, there would be amendments to it. And, um, so I'm comfortable with whatever you wish to do, Robin. Um, and on this one, uh, the motion could even be that um, to include this question subject to the outcome of the work group. Okay, yeah, so then I think I would amend um, my motion to include a question um, similar to question one as um, worked through with the work group. So that was not very artful, but basically what I'm trying to say is we want to get this type of information. Uh, the party should figure out the right way to state it. We'll put this in as a placeholder and then we can revise it when we have the right question. It would have to be done in time for obviously hospitals to submit. Yeah. 
Is there the seconder in agreement with the amended motion? I am. Okay. Is there any further public comment? <clears throat> Hearing none, those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Okay. So, um, Robin, I believe that uh, um, there is the no other... further motion required as far as the discussion on the uh, um, document from the healthcare advocate, unless you believe there is. Um, I think in the first part, which so Patrick had pointed out a suggestion for revised language related to the federal funding, which is earlier in the document. We haven't talked about and what I was going to suggest here is it it would make sense to me to have I think it could be in the narrative but really what we're asking for is in that worksheet for the other columns to be I, I, I guess I'm asking Patrick does this make sense in in the narrative to you or does it make sense on the worksheet and uh, in terms of collecting the information uh, that since it is an evolving situation. Um, so that's question one. Um, to me, I would not ask the hospitals to necessarily each and every hospital to describe the factors and the status, because it seems to me that the funding process would be uh, either in law or in exec in an administrative agency. And like last year, we had AHS to come in and talk about the factors in the process. It seems a little redundant to have each hospital basically what say what should be the same legal criteria and process. So personally, I would figure out another way to do that so that hospitals don't have to deal with that. If they've applied for something and they don't know if they're gonna get it, I think we'd wanna know that. I don't know if that makes sense to other people. But I think we could narrow it a little bit is what I'm saying. I think it, it does make sense because uh, um, obviously we're getting the uh, the briefings on any uh, um, bulletins that are, are released from HRSA or others, in, including the state of Vermont, um, so that we could follow that. But uh, um, Patrick, what are your thoughts? So to answer uh, Robin's questions, <clears throat> I think it makes sense in the narrative, not necessarily in the appendix, because they may be anticipating receipt of something, or to the HCA's point, potential COVID funding. They, they're not going to, they're not going to book that on that breakout, because they don't know. So they can't just throw numbers in there. It would yep. be a better, it'd be a better talking point for them, a la last year when we were waiting on AHS. You know, they they didn't know, but if they think they've met all the qualifications, it would be nice to know if there's additional revenue coming down. So I think the narrative is probably where that belongs. Yeah, I agree with Patrick as well. I think it's the narrative because I think it's it's probably the any funding that's not able to be put on the chart because they haven't, you know, received it. And I don't think the question is that onerous, particularly with, you know, kind of the new funding that potentially is out there and the uncertainty of whether people, you know, whether they can get it or not, but they may apply. So, you know, and may not have gone through that process yet when they do their budget. So I think it's, it's just a question of, is there anything else out there? And since this is so evolving, we don't know what we don't know. And we, you know, we don't know what's going to be out there July 1st. So I think it's, a fair question and, and I think it belongs in the narrative. Somebody want to make that motion? So I would move that we include um, an addition to the narrative which would ask the hospitals to describe to the best of their knowledge other potential COVID-19 relief funds that the hospital could receive including amounts and uh, I guess I would say including amounts um, and that we would 
collect information regarding um, factors and process prior to the budget process um, ourselves. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Okay. Um, again, I'd like to open it up for public discussion and then we'll have a board discussion and vote. So any member of the public who wishes to offer any input on this motion? And Jeff Tiemann, I see your hand up. Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman, I would, I would just add that we heard just this morning on a federal update that HHS is still very much in the process of even examining what the factors will be in determining how the application process works, the criteria, the eligibility. So just know that Vaz is happy to supply the board with that sort of systemic information as soon as we have it. Um, and we'll keep you posted to the best of our ability on that. It's just still very much in process. There's not even an HHS secretary in place. Thank, Thank you, you, Jeff. And uh, you, you always do a great job of keeping us updated and we, re we really appreciate that. Other public comment? Seeing none, I'll open it up to board discussion on the motion. Assuming my audio is not broken, I'm going to open it up to a um, uh, vote on the motion. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion uh, carries unanimously. Um, moving on, Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> so next up, um, we're going to move into some of the um, varying looks that um, some board members had requested we provide around MPR and FPP and some of the staff perspective on that and the staff recommendation. And Robin, I'm looking at you. We will have established motion language after each one of these next talking points. So we should be able to facilitate that a little better than our last discussion here. So <clears throat> I'll start off with, um, I believe it was board member Holmes had um, discussed last week about providing a potential um, hypothetical view of if we rolled forward 3.5% growth each year from the last year of pre-pandemic actuals being 2019 to take a look at where the system would have landed in each of those years and where fiscal year 22 would land. So up on your screen on slide six, <clears throat> you'll see us applying a flat 3.5% MPR growth rate to each hospital and culminating in a system perspective that ends up with a total system MPR FPP of almost $2.87 billion based on um, the roll forward from those 2019 actuals. <clears throat> in the next view, we took what you approved in fiscal year 2021 <clears throat> and we compared it to that hypothetical roll forward. So you'll see at the bottom, which is the most important view here for the system, is that there's about a 2.9% difference between what you approved and what that hypothetical 3.5 would look like if it had rolled over across those years up to fiscal year 2022. We don't recommend you look at individual hospitals because as we know, and I'll highlight Rutland here, their budget last year came in well under what it was for 2020. So in order to cover that hypothetical gap, it's going to show a much larger year over year um, growth differential there at 14.9%. So it's not exactly an individual hospital look we kept with that consistency, but really that 2.9% is um, the focus for this slide in comparing that hypothetical to what you approved for fiscal year 2021. Um, <clears throat> on the next slide, we wanted to provide you with another perspective that takes what you approved across the system. And if you were to approve a 3.5% growth on top of 2021 where the system would end up and where each individual hospital would end up. Now this is a little more um, important to look at each individual hospital because now we're saying if you 
if you approve 3.5%, here's the growth potential for each hospital. And the system would come in at 2.88 billion. Now that's a little higher than the previous slide by about, I think, 17 or $18 million. So 3.5% growth on top of what you approved would come in slightly higher than the hypothetical situation that we've laid out for you to this point. So I hope everyone is following along. These are different perspectives to help our board um, understand um, the potential for a hospital system based on varying looks. And a lot of times we would just do this in a, in a large spreadsheet and we've had to break it out on these individual slides. So um, I hope you can bear with me as we navigate. So pivoting away from that look, the staff, <clears throat> as, as many of you know through the reports we've done um, over the years and up to at least two weeks ago, whenever we look at the system, we try to provide a five-year look back for context based on what was um, approved by the board and what actually happened. So here we have 2015 to 2020, that's six years, but it allows us to do two slightly different five-year looks. So on slide nine, you'll see the budgeted growth ceiling set by the board from 2015 to 2020. And it ranges from a low of 3.2% in 2019 to a high of 3.8% in 2050. To the right of that, we have the actual growth that occurred in those years. And that ranges from a low of negative 6.3% that we've discussed in the last couple of weeks for 2020, all the way up to 5% growth in 2015. So the two different looks we're going for here are, <clears throat> one, we're looking at averages versus medians, and two, we're looking at fiscal year 16 to 25-year look for an average, and then we're omitting 2020 because of the actual activity that happened despite the board approving 3.5. So we're looking at a world with a five-year look with COVID and a five-year look without it for averages and medians, and we're trying to dial in um, some uh, relative judgment here based on what the system is ha has actually performed and what its potential could be moving into fiscal year 22. So you can see here at the bottom, the two five-year looks, including excluding the averages for the budgeted growth ceiling really don't move because again, the window is much smaller, 3.2 to 3.8. But when you look at the actual growth, there's a much bigger variance there with and without COVID. It's almost 2.3%. So the averages are, are, are dragging down, um, 2020 especially is dragging down the average for the view that provides the average. And that 5% um, pre-COVID is pulling that average up. So there's a pretty big window there of fluctuation and variability between those two looks. So we wanted to take another look that might remove those outliers. And in order to do that, we decided to look at the median. So you can see here, the median with and without for actual growth is only about 0.1% difference. And in fact, the one prior to aligns with the hypothetical that we set out earlier in this discussion. So we've got a hypothetical that um, potential percent variance from what was actually approved. And now we've got a median with and without COVID that is relative to that range. So, <clears throat> We decided we'd go with the median perspective because those averages can be greatly skewed by the activity that has occurred, uh, especially the impact of COVID. So with that, the staff is recommending 3% NPR budget to budget growth. And our rationale behind that is it does allow the hospital system for room to grow for utilization bounce back. And of course we, can fully admit all of us, the hospitals included, really don't know what that could look like as, as society becomes vaccinated. We are, as a hospital system and, and provider care network, very dependent on human behavior for what happens in the coming year. And so we think the 3.5% budget to budget growth might be a little too high considering all of that unknown regarding utilization and budgeting challenges during a pandemic. <clears throat> and because um, we're looking at medians at 2.8 and 2.9%. And if I toggle back up, we're looking at a system between 17, 18, and 19 that shifted between 2.8 and 2.9%. So we feel three is, is a number that allows for some utilization bounce back, but likely does not acknowledge um, 
so much utilization bounce back that the system gets back to 3.5% NPR growth. So with that, our perspective also maintains that historical information. Um, and again, we use that median actual to actual growth um, to remove the outliers from um, COVID. So <clears throat> that, Mr. Chair, I'll stop here at the motion language um, because that concludes our piece on NPR and we'll turn it back over to the board to discuss um, the varying looks the staff have provided on NPR FPP growth and the staff's recommendation. Okay, for okay. questions or discussion, NPR FPP um, recommend, recommended uh, ceilings for the students. I have, I have a clarifying question, um, which is, so we're in the guidance document, we had included um, language that would indicate that COVID uh, vaccine related expenses would not, you know, could exceed NPR. So when we're thinking about this piece of it, we also have, there is really an additional variance to go above this related to the, the I don't have the exact language in front of me, but I just thought we should have this in context of, the, of that piece as well. But you're correct in, in your understanding, at least as far as I understand it, that um, we have made it clear that um, the um, anything, any expense related to testing and vaccines um, should not be treated as um, traditional operating revenue or expenses. Have I got that correct, Patrick? That's correct. We're providing a breakout for that. So you'll be able to see what the hospital is requesting <clears throat> with that information built in and what they're requesting with that information extracted. Thank Other you. board members. Uh, yeah, just a couple questions. Um, and, and I think we may not know this answer, but do we know where things are trending in 21? So, you know, how far behind they are? Do we even have first quarter quarter data there? Because it would be, you know, good to get a reference point on how 21 is looking. Um, you know, I um, also think either for the record, you know, whether or not we're going to align on something today or not, but. Um, you know, we may want to have a chart that actually shows what you're doing, you know, shows the 3% compared to the three and a half compared to the, the three year trends that we had looked at. So kind of taking all everything we have for potential 22, right? One was doing the, you know, I think one is at uh, 2887 or what was it like? So we have the three charts kind of one is at yeah, 2869. Then if we did the three and a half year, three and a half percent growth, that's 2887. And I think this is 2872, 2.872, is that correct? The 3%? So I think that's the number we're comparing if, if other board members wanted to look at what what is 3% equal, right? So, it's, so you'd like us to provide this look up here on the screen with our recommendation? Yeah, I think, you know, so this is three and a half, right, which is 2887 at the bottom. 3% is 2872, which is close to the three and a half percent growth trended forward on the first slide, which was 2869. So I'm just trying to put that relative um, in all those. Um, but then I would add to that. Um, I'm not opposed to sticking with a three and a half with the thought that, you know, maybe 22 is going to be the year without COVID at all. And 21 is certainly still impacted by that. And, you know, I know from people I've talked to, they haven't gone to the hospital, you know, doctors and things for things maybe they, they would normally <laughs> or would have in the past couple of years. So, kind of what we thought maybe was going to happen this year, which is the pent up demand would move forward. 
I think that may still be kicked out a year, but um, that may be something when we get to public comments, uh, some of the hospitals could respond to whether they think that's the expectation or not. So it, it's really, to me, it's more, there's just still this unknown of what will happen and whether to put it at three or three and a half. Um, and also depending on where we go with the future conversation on charge, you know, there'll be limiters on, you know, how people could get there. It's going to happen or not, right? Either people are going to come in the door or not. So, so I'm not opposed to doing three and a half, but would like to hear what other board members think. And again, it's really predominantly because of the unknown and whether or not this pent up demand will come back at all. And if it's going to occur in this fiscal year, which we're already six months into and still in the pandemic or going into next year. Kevin, maybe I'll I'll hop in there if you if you want another opinion. Go ahead, Jess. Okay. Um, so I've done a lot of thinking about this, and the uncertainty absolutely weighs on me that Maureen was just talking about. Um, I think we can all appreciate the struggles that we've had over the past year, and indeed that we're still in a current pandemic. I, there's hope on the horizon, but we don't really know, right? Variants are lurking. Not everybody's vaccinated yet, and we don't, to Maureen's point, know what pent up demand is going to look like. So there's a lot we don't know. I think I wanna just circle back to what we do know. And what we do know is that pre-COVID hospital margin averages were under 1%. Seven hospitals were in the red on their operating margin. Um, hospitals are now emerging or, you know, hopefully we're in the later stages of this pandemic in very, very financially different positions. If you look at, you know, fiscal year 20 actuals for North Country, for example, they posted their highest operating margin in at least the last five years. It was a healthy margin of 3.7%. Porter emerged with their second highest margin in at least five years. The Academic Medical Center, at least as far as I remember, posted their first operating loss for the first time since I've been on the board. Um, so very, very different positions that they're emerging from um, the situation from 2020. And the, the total margins tell an even more complicated story, right? You can look at Brattleboro's year over year increase in total margin, you know, 600 plus percent. UVM's was 127 percent decline, right? Some of those dollars that are contributing to those margins may be clawed back by the feds. We just don't know. So regardless um, I feel like we're in a lot of uncertainty and the situations for each hospital are so very, very different. So my point is every hospital is unique. They always are, but this year more than ever. So I, I'm going to take an interesting, I don't know, interesting stance that um, may or may not have <laughs> be a consensus place where we can build consensus around. But I feel more and more strongly as I think about this, that applying a one size fits all hard and fast ceiling in the budget guidance, even recognizing that it's budget guidance and we would always review the budgets anyway. But I feel like that is not an approach that I would want to personally take. I don't feel like I have enough data to feel comfortable setting a target or a ceiling. Frankly, I would rather see the, the, um, the board adopt a process that allows every hospital to submit a budget that allows them to maintain and improve access and quality, cover their costs and, and move towards more sound financial footing if they're financially vulnerable right now. I would hope that the hospitals would consider affordability in that approach as they're thinking about what their commercial rate changes would be and recognize that commercial rate is not the only vehicle through which to increase financial sustainability. But um, along those lines, while I don't f favor setting a hard and fast ceiling on an NPR or frankly even charge, I would be in favor of a process that allowed presumptive approval, I brought this up last Wednesday, of any submitted budget whose NPR FPP growth rate falls at or below 3.5 and uh, has a change in charge. I know we haven't talked about that yet, but since we're talking about NPR, to me, they go together. Um, that change in charge would be at or below 3.5. And let me tell you why I sort of honed in on these numbers. Um, why 3.5 for NPR? It, like Patrick just went through, it's the median budgeted growth for the past five years, right? The average for 2015 to 2019 was 3.6. The median actual has been lower at 2.9. 
But I also think that this 3.5 allows for, I think, the very real possibility of pent up demand. You know, anecdotal evidence, of course, but I know many people who are seeking care, but waiting for the vaccine. So, and we know we've been hearing from, you know, there's other sources out there that insurance companies and others who are projecting, you know, return to a lot of this demand that we're not seeing in 20 and maybe not even seeing in the first half of 2021, because people are waiting for their vaccines to go out and get the care that um, they've postponed. The, I can talk about the 3-5, um, I can hold off on that piece, but I guess what I'm arguing in favor of at this point in time is we have too much uncertainty to set a target. And I would rather allow some flexibility for the hospitals to submit what they need. Uh, we will then scrutinize, they'll have to justify their need for whether it's NPR or whether it's their charge or whatever the components that we would be looking at. But if a hospital falls below at least those two parameters for me, I would feel comfortable saying you've met, you know, uh, these thresholds and you, we would waive your hearing, assuming some other conditions are met and some of your future slides, Patrick, go through what some of those conditions might be. But I think I'm just I'm arguing in favor of not having a hard and fast ceiling, but allowing uh, presumptive approval of budgets that fall below a certain threshold. So just one uh, thing I just want to correct there. There's nobody that uh, has any language that suggested a target. A ceiling. Okay. <laughs> so. I guess I'm not comfortable setting a ceiling when I don't know what pent up demand is going to look like. I don't have that crystal ball and it feels uncomfortable to me without having evidence to set a ceiling on NPR growth, recognizing full well that this is a, a guidance, but I would prefer not to do that. So that's my personal position on that. Thank you, Jess. Other board members? Yeah, I, I have to, I, the, the word that Jess used is uncomfortable. I feel uncomfortable with a ceiling too. Um, and I kind of look at uh, the 2021 budget where the distribution of, of that 3.5%, uh, we ended up uh, with a, a NPR increase of 2.7%. But UVM Medical Center got a five percent increase, and all and the rest of the hospitals combined were at four tenths of one percent. And so here you have these four tenths of one percent hospitals kind of coming into um, you know 2022. And and I, I don't have a feel um, or you know information as to how things are actually going on the ground um, you know during this year. Um, so I, I I'm uncomfortable having a ceiling that applies to all hospitals um, or, or that applies system wide and therefore applies to all hospitals without having uh, some flexibility in that in the distribution of that across hospitals uh, because a hospital coming in with a four tenths of one percent increase you know uh, for uh, 2021 over 2020, is different than a hospital coming in with a 5% increase, I would think. It, it, it was a very skewed distribution in 2021. And that worries me that um, uh, we we head into 2022 and um, there's not flexibility. If there is to be a ceiling, there's got to be some flexibility to move that around um, uh, so that all hospitals are are treated fairly Given, given their history. Um, and I don't know what that is yet, but I, I, I align myself with, with um, Jess in terms of feeling uncomfortable about a, a kind of a blanket ceiling that's applied system-wide when we have these 14 hospitals in a skewed system in 2021 or a skewed distribution in 2021. Other board members? Yeah, I'll just add a couple of things. I mean, we've, this has always been a challenge, right? Having one fixed number for all the hospitals. I think I've brought that up, you know, multiple times over the years that everybody is not the same. So, so I think, um, you know, that that is part of a challenge there, you know, that, that we face when we look at each hospital and what their demographics and what's going on. Um, one one other way to look at whether it's a, a, a ceiling or kind of a variable number um, could be to propose something where we, whether it's 3% or 3.5%, and then 
for hospitals to show what their added utilization may be, you know, pent up demand might be that might bring them above that. So I guess the, you know, the, the issue is really what would be above that number, right? If we did boo a ceiling and then, and then we got hospitals that came above that. I'm just throwing that out there as an option. I mean, because the other piece of it is we roll forward every year. And so as you roll forward into the next year, you know, where do you start, right? Is is part of it? Well, whatever was in twenty two had a component that was pent up demand. I mean, I think if we do this, it's going to carry into the next year as well to a degree. It may not be so much a ceiling as to say is it going to be below, but um, you know, in the event that pent up demand occurred in twenty two, that maybe inflated that number and wasn't something that would would carry over. Um, and I know that the hospitals obviously have discipline as they're going through this. A concern is um, they work on such thin margins and expenses tend to happen, as we saw last year with the numbers, lots of different moving pieces, absolutely, but NPR didn't, expenses did. And as if, 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 if there is no ceiling, no guidance there, and, and the numbers are built higher, their expense budgets will follow and be harder to cut. Um, not saying we manage expense budgets. That's not what I'm saying, because <laughs> you know, that will come, uh, there's been some pushback on that. I'm just saying, you know, by the way you build a budget, you're going to build a budget with a 2% return, 3% return, whatever it is. So whatever you put for top line, you're going to have an expense load there. And what has been shown is an inability to um, bring those expenses down when you don't hit the top line. So I, I, told, I do agree, though, that there's a lot of uncertainty. So I'm not saying I wouldn't go for that. I'm just trying to put out, you know, let's also make sure we're thinking about the year after and, and thinking about some other things in there as well. But I've always said the 14 hospitals are not the same. Um, and, you know, three and a half or some will never hit it. <laughs> And others might exceed it if they have more patients coming and um, things like that that would drive that. So, you know, maybe it's the time to start to get away from that. I don't know. Other board members. Sure. Um, I I like the idea of setting. Um, I can't remember exactly how Jess described it, but setting basically a threshold for presumptive approval that it would include an NPR number and a charge number um, that would allow for waivers of hearings. And we can talk about the criteria for that in the later slides. I like that idea. To me, the whole, like I'm not uncomfortable with the ceiling because quite frankly, I've always thought of it as a ceiling. Um, and that's from the long ago statutory uh, development and legislative discussion, it was meant to act as a cap. So, um, and we, and with the idea that the guidance was guidance, it was not, it was going to be tailored to each of the 14 hospitals. And we do do that every year. So it's, it's not meant to be hard and fast in that sense. So I, I guess just because this is the way I've always thought about it is that it's meant to provide kind of a directional signal uh, about submissions, but that um, it, of course, would get tailored based on individual circumstances. With all that said, I, I think it may be just kind of semantics because I think that in reality, if, if we do end up going with this concept of a threshold that would waive hearings, um, then that's how the guidance would read. And so it kind of takes away whether we need to use the word ceiling or not in that um, because it's a different sort of setting, really, that the hearing waiver becomes that piece of the written guidance. So um, that's just my two cents there. In terms of the number, um, I, uh, and I'll just stick with NPR to start, I, um, in looking at the historical performance and the analysis that Patrick and the staff did, which I found very helpful, and thinking about all the uncertainty and the pent up demand, I would be uh, more comfortable going with um, three and a half percent. And I, I, in that same part, 
because of the historical looks that are in the staff materials. Um, and while I think people sometimes think that the three and a half was kind of an arbitrary number in the all payer model, it was actually linked to historic economic growth. And so it's not uh, just a number picked out of the sky. Um, and I, to me, the point of doing a total cost of care uh, framework in a statewide agreement is to set uh, really a, a goalpost, if you will, over a long period of time. So um, it's cons the consistency with the, that and the previous economic growth is, is, is also appealing to me, although I certainly would understand that from a CFO perspective, uh, state economic growth historically may or may not feel like the right conceptual approach, especially in the COVID era. So uh, coincidentally, it also happens in this case to line up with being around uh, the average and a little bit higher than the median to allow for that uh, bounce back. So that's just my initial thinking. I'm, I'm open to, I'm not stuck necessarily on that specific number. I'm open to other conversation and public comment to, before I finalize that particular thought. Thank you, Robin. So I'm gonna offer uh, my two cents. It's probably a minority opinion, um, but I agree with most everything that's been said by each of the board members so far. Um, so I'll proceed with my my, my minority view. Um, and like Robin, I have always considered that the board look at each and every hospital on an ind individual basis. And that, that process occurs at hearing. And this is guidance um, moving into those hearings. And so I think that um, because costs to Vermonters are not just a function of the actual um, prices paid based on utilization as well, this is an unprecedented year. And it will be tough for anyone to have the, the uh, crystal ball to look into and come to that. But with that being said, I still believe that there should be language in the guidance. Um, if I had to pick the magic number, it would be 3.25%. And if we were to go down the road of a presumptive approval, um, which I do support, um, I think that number has to be lower than what is in the guidance. And I think that number should be at the 3%. Um, that's my two cents. Any further feedback from the board before I open it up to public discussion? Um, yeah, just to, um, to go on what you're saying, Kevin, as well, um, going back to you know the decisions that we had last year, and we had obviously a ceiling for last year, and we had several hospitals, I'm trying to count them up, but maybe maybe nine, eight or nine of the hospitals came in with higher requests than the ceiling. And um, I think five of them, we, we agreed to higher amounts versus the ceiling. And the couple that we brought down had a history of of asking for much higher and never hitting the numbers. So we wanted to try to bring them down. Be, you know, we said, if you get there, fine, but you, you haven't done that in the past. And so we don't want you, you know, tying those expenses. But the point of that is really to show that, you know, yes, we put this number out there and we have, you know, in some cases significantly gone above. We had an 8.7. We reduced them to 8.3. We had a 5.7. We did reduce it to 5. We had, um, you know, most of them, we had a 4.6. We gave them the 4.6. Uh, we had a 5.3. I think we brought it down to 4.8. So we, we had many that we allowed over. So I, I think it, it's kind of, do you say, okay, there's no ceiling, right? And then, then that gives one message, or do, you know, I think my vote would be more to put the ceiling in, put it in at three and a half, and know that as each hospital comes in individually, we are gonna look at that, and that's what we have done in the past. And many last year came in below the numbers. And, you know, so in total, I think it came out lower, but there was certainly a mix of 
more than half asked for higher numbers and we gave higher numbers um, based on that. So I, I'm not too caught up on if we put a number, you know, if we don't, if we have a number out there that we won't listen to what each hospital comes in with. If I could just, you know, I mean, your point is, is very well taken, but it sort of suggests that setting the signal, setting the ceiling is rather ineffective. Right. If if half the hospitals exceeded in their budget submission, it's, it's a rather an ineffective tool. Um, in a year where we had more evidence about what that ceiling should be, I would say, hey, this is a, this is the ceiling, and here's why, and we're and we're using you know evidence to back that up. But in this year, where it's really very unclear what that ceiling should be, um, and we're and you know it's it, it last year proved to be ineffective at setting that ceiling anyway. I guess I would say that if we're interested in, in sending signals about what we feel like are some guardrails, we do that through the waiver thresholds. That's setting the signals and some you get signaling what we think is, is appropriate uh, or hopeful budgeting. But it allows for the flexibility. And I would also say sometimes in my experience when we've set ceilings, some hospitals will try and hit that ceiling even though it's aspirational and they can't make it. And so by setting that signal, you know, by setting that ceiling, you also get some hospitals that are, you know, never going to make it trying to submit a budget that meets that ceiling. So you've got issues on both sides. And so this year to me, and I'll stop talking after this, but with so much uncertainty and with its proven ineffectiveness last year anyway at, at you know, being particularly meaningful because hospitals are going to submit the budgets that they need. Why not let hospitals submit the budgets that they need? And then we do what we always do, which is look through all the hospitals and try and understand what are their needs. But by sending that signal about what the waiver thresholds are, we are supplying some guardrails and we're relinquishing some of the administrative burden associated with the hearings and all of that if you've met those thresholds. So that's, I guess, my final say. Other board members? I just strongly disagree that it's ineffective. So, I mean, because I think the point is to speak, because quite frankly, like we, we acknowledge that the only way to make a more nuanced than ceiling would be to do it with more nuance and have it by hospital category. I mean, we're looking at it as a statewide kind of high level tool. So of course there's gonna be a lot of variation. Um, so I don't actually agree that that's a, a signal that it's ineffective. Um, I think there's just a lot of variation in our hospital system and, and that's appropriate, but it does send some, it gives some, the hospital some idea of where our heads are and overall growth trend. So I, that's all, and then now I will be quiet. Other board members? So at this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment on a discussion on NPR, FPP. Um, and the first hand that I saw up was Dale Hackett. Dale? Can you hear me? We can. OK, I just have a concern. It's the best I can follow it, um, either 3.0 or 3.5. I think what I would want to focus on is the issue of that backlog. Um, and don't I don't know it'll show up in 2021. I see it as first they have to get to a point where there's enough people vaccinated that you don't have 15 minutes between each patient seen. That will increase utilization, but that's normal utilization they're trying to get back to. That could easily take 2021 to do that. And then it's in 2022, that ceiling you're talking about, if you think of it as more of a roof with two feet of snow on it, or instead of two feet of snow, it's two feet of names of backlog of people that didn't get their annual checkups. Um, you don't even have the workforce to serve the backlog, unless you hire people, because um, you got to increase the utilization capacity to work off the backlog, or you never actually do work off the backlog. You will always stay behind. So, do I want to put a ceiling that 
prevents them from doing what they need to do to catch up? Um, no, I'm pretty sure I don't. I can probably capture the data. What's a patient seen? And what's a patient that is backlogged? Because it's going to be right in the records. They should have had their annual checkup last April. They didn't even get one this April. It might be they get a checkup next January. Um, I can capture that data and show it as its backlog. Um, I don't know how much that costs the hospitals. I don't know how difficult that is within the analytics. It's pretty easy to say, um, <laughs> as, as we've seen so often, easy to say and easy to do. Don't always, that's not an apples to apples comparison either. Um, <laughs> excuse me. So I don't know what the right number is. I know I don't want to keep them from doing what they need to do to actually provide the services needed. And I, I'm afraid I have to stop there as far as my comment. It doesn't really provide an answer. It just provides I'm concerned about preventing them from being able to do that and a comment. Thank you, Dale. And I think that uh, everyone uh, shares that same opinion that we want people who have delayed care to get the proper preventive care, the proper screenings, the proper um, uh, checkups um, to make sure that they're not more expensive going into the future. Um, but I still think there is a proper place for um, guidance here. And uh, with that, I'm going to go next to the, the next hand I saw up was Jeff Tiemann, and on deck will be Claudio Fort. So, Jeff. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I had a, I had a few comments that were uh, sort of on both substance and process. So I'm just going to make them all at once, if that's OK. That's fine. OK. So I just want to start by rewinding for, for a minute back to a 2017 Green Mountain Care Board meeting um, that no one probably remembers, but where I said that we need to have budgets that are adequate so that hospitals can manage any kind of emergency response. Four years ago, without any kind of glimmer of COVID in my eye, I knew that statement was true. It's our social duty to be prepared for this kind of crisis. At the time, I was thinking more like a tropical storm or a mass shooting. We now know one year into the global pandemic that has killed millions, um, <clears throat> that COVID's a lot worse than anything we could have imagined. Um, so my comments may have seemed at the time like a dramatic expression of a worst case scenario, but look where we are. So I, I do understand that when the regulator heard our request from the association to suspend the annual budget review process, that it may have been shocking. But having worked so closely with our hospitals over these last 12 months on pandemic response, with life and death repercussions every day. I will go to the mat for them over and over and over again. If you sat where I do, you would do the same and you would wanna clear their decks, give them room to breathe and plan, and you would advocate on their behalf without any reservation. We need to prioritize public health and pandemic recovery, which is really what prompted the request for relief from the process in the first place. And in a related um, note, Hospitals need the ability to grow and operate at a level that enables them to continue their missions, to avoid considering cutting services or making programmatic changes that could threaten access. So we strongly encourage you to regulate hospitals and choose a mechanism for that that enables both margin and mission. If you're unwilling to suspend the process as today's discussion would suggest, we encourage you as we did in the letters to streamline it and enable hospitals to, to achieve a reasonable margin and grow at a rate that at least matches medical inflation. This is a very unusual moment, and all of us want to emerge from the pandemic stronger, not weaker, um, more resilient and ready, not less so. Declining margins foretell a pretty daunting future where access could be limited, quality eroded, and costs growing. So on the simplicity piece, just to be clear, what we mean by a process that's simplified is minimizing follow-up to hospitals and the Q&A process, creating an option to avoid hearings, as has been discussed a little bit here today, if hospitals come in at a certain level. Those are steps that would simplify the process and deliver some of the information or most of the information that you need to do your job. So I'm somewhat encouraged by the direction uh, of this conversation, although the details still matter a lot. 
Put simply, we, we think you should allow for NPR growth that provides for hospital stability and covers inflation at four to five percent, which includes pharmaceutical inflation and increased COVID expenses, among other areas. That you use your regulatory authority to regulate through the collection and assessment of information throughout the year. Um, and of course, allow hospitals to invest in their facilities and in health reform and in social determinants with a constant lens on affordability and all the priorities we share. I, I know this is super hard work. Um, I'll just repeat what I always say. We share the same goals, but how we get there is really important. This is not an er ordinary moment, so I would hope we don't treat it as one. Um, and since I've read from my pre-written comments, I am happy to submit them for the record. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jeff. We would appreciate if you did submit those for the record. Um, and thank you for your thoughtful uh, response. So next is Claudio Fort, and after that, next in queue will be Hamilton Davis. Claudio. So hi, folks. Um, I'm uh, Claudio Fort. Uh, for the past three years, I've had the privilege of serving as the president and CEO here at Rutland Regional Medical Center. And prior to that, I spent uh, about 10 years as the president and CEO of North Country Hospital. So I've had the opportunity to see um, the perspective from the Northeast Kingdom to Rutland County, from a critical access hospital to a PPS hospital. And I'll echo some of the things that uh, Jeff Tiemann said on, on, you know, kind of the environment here in our hospitals right now. It has been an unprecedented year for us. Um, and I think we have responded admirably. I think our whole state has, and I extend that to members of the board. I appreciate some of the consideration that you have given us over this past year and that you're hearing, you know, our appeals and our pleas. And I know you're in communities where you see the work that we are doing on the ground. But the staff here have done uh, just some uh, heroic work. And, um, you know, we've stepped up testing programs. And now, you know, within a couple of weeks, we developed uh, a, you know, a vaccine program, which is very, very complex and complicated. And no one's ever done it before. And so a lot of our staff are stretched pretty thin. They have, you know, their world has compressed. Um, and I think for healthcare people, I think we have to appreciate that the leaders in healthcare, the clinicians, not only have their own burdens to carry and their own challenges, but they take on those of the patients and the vulnerable that they serve. And the leaders here in the healthcare organization take on those of the fears and the, and the vulnerabilities of the staff who we are leading and trying to do this. So um, your consideration on this year's budget process, which is so atypical, would be appreciated. And just a, a little more specifically to echo some of the comments, uh, and I appreciate those from some of the board members, for Rutland Regional to set a 3% or even a 3.5% budget to budget NPR, FPP growth ceiling, essentially bakes in what we believe could be temporary, temporary and artificially low volumes that we projected in our fiscal 2021 budget. And these lower volumes and revenues were directly due to the COVID crisis response. And the challenge is we do not know if those volume reductions will be temporary or are they gonna be permanent? Or are they gonna be somewhere in between? As Dr. Holmes said, we may see a phenomenon of pent up demand and experience atypical greater, atypically greater volumes throughout fiscal 2022, as more confidence patients, you know, confident patients catch up on care they've put off. Uh, conversely, we may see a slower return to pre-COVID volumes, or we may never see those volumes return. The fact of the matter is no one in this meeting has ever experienced anything like this unprecedented global health crisis, not in our lifetimes, and we simply cannot predict what the longer term effects or what the new normal will look like. So I appreciate your consideration of our situation and not, you know, and your consideration to not impose restrictions like, you know, these artificial ceiling amounts this year that could significantly hamper our hospitals, and then by extension, our communities 
ability to recover during this, this critical year. So thank you for uh, the ability to comment on that. Thank you, Claudio. And of course, we would look at um, what you would put in for um, last year's budget uh, during the hearing and understand that um, you, along with several of your colleagues, put in budgets that uh, um, took into account the fact that you quickly realized that there would be a decrease in utilization due to screenings and protocols and all kinds of other factors that uh, were involved. So um, the next uh, person up will be Hamilton Davis and Tom D will be on deck. Uh, Kevin, can you hear me? I'm not we can. Go ahead, Ham. Thank you. Um, I think it's very interesting. I, I think it was uh, it really, I think the whole board discussion starting with Jessica's uh little talk um is getting at the point well, my view is this and i i i think in in this room an actual room i've been in more of these hearings than anybody else for years worth. i think that the the uh the it really doesn't matter what you said is an npr ceiling what really is going on in the system is at any hospital um i don't care whether it's grace cottage or whether it's uh Rutland with uh, four, they're going to take they're going to take care of the patients that come in their door and they're going to do they're going to they're not going to turn patients away they're going to turn they're going to do the they're going to do patients that they get and what we've, what we've had for several years that maureen keeps pointing out is they they're aspirationals to get small hospitals critical access hospitals that hope to have more traffic and they end up with less and so their expenses go up but they but in fact they can't get the patients if any hospital is going to do all the patients that it can get in the door. And the question then is how you manage that. To me, the single the, the two problems here are really that you're you can't regulate, I don't believe, you can't rack you can't regulate an a five hundred bed academic medical center that basically pays all its people on salaries. Um, with 25 bed critical access hospitals. But I think, so I don't think it matters where you come down on this. You can do, you can have uh, a ceiling for, or call it a ceiling, and call it anything you want. You can have an NPR number, okay, and just call it an ice cream cone. You can have that number for, for all the hospitals. It won't matter. The, 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 all the hospitals will do all the work that they can they can do. The case that I think, I know we haven't gotten there, that, that, got there yet, Kevin, but the real issue, it seems to me, is that the really driving question here in so far as regulation is concerned is going to come in the next piece, which is uh, given what the people have, people, given that the hospitals are going to do what the hospitals do, Claudio Ford's going to take care of all of his patients. Uh, whoever's running Gifford is going to take care of all his patients. Brumstead's going to take care of all of his patients. The real question will become how much uh, the real hard question is, how much will you let the hospitals recover um, in your commercial ask? Thank you. Thank you, Ham. Tom D. And next on deck will be Stephen Majetic. So we're going to get the uh, Bennington flavor. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. And <laughs> um, and, and the chair. I, I, oh, let me make sure I'm... Can you hear me okay? We can, Tom. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. And um, I, I want to just state, and I, and I appreciate the, the direction of the discussion that Jessica was, was starting to drive this. I, I think it's, um, I, I think this has been a very thoughtful process by discussion by all the board members. So I, I, I applaud you there. Um, I, mean, I, I really have to support the notions that um, both Jeff and Claudio raised. Um, I, I think, you know, at Southwestern, we, we take this, the Green Mountain Care budget process very much to heart. It really is. And I will tell you, we, we kind of take it as an organizational challenge, and we have inst institutional pride of how we develop the budget process. And it really is very much of a, an organizational-wide effort. It's, it's a top-down, bottom-up effort that we have. We spend countless hours doing this. And, um, and if there's ever a time for all of us to take a step back and to understand that this is a this is a special time and we need to think outside the box and you need and I, I know this may sound crazy talking in a regulatory 
body, but you need to have a little bit of trust in us as to what we're trying to deliver here and what we're trying to do and that we'll, and that we will be doing the right thing. And, um, you know, as I look at our organization over the last year, you know, we have pretty much done many, many different things that are out of the norm. You know, from, you know, when we put a, you know, we've, we've now have been an incident command every day, Every uh, every day in terms of, of really the past year, getting ready to deal with this this challenge that we're faced with, and and, and we need we've needed it. You know, it wasn't long ago, a few weeks ago, we were running at 25 COVID patients a day here, and we have redeployed our many many of our management team members and our employees to help deal with this, and they've done it in a in a in a selfish way, and. Um, and it's really has been taxing. Our, our team is really at a point of, and I don't want to say a breaking point, but we're at a point that we're tired and, and we don't have a lot of juice left here. But yet we see some light at the end of the tunnel, which makes us feel pretty good. But um, we have things here that we you know, a year ago we didn't have. I mean, I have over 50 FTEs, redeployed FTEs who are now staffing uh, vaccine clinics, and we have now three testing centers. We've created a respiratory evaluation center for, for, uh, for our COVID patients. So what we're going through is is a is something that I have never dealt with in my career, and it's very hard to, to predict what's going on. But one thing I, I'm I'm feeling more and more confident we're going to see a bounce back in the next 12 months. I mean our ER volume. Our um, our our um, express care volume, which are our walk-in centers, our primary care centers, are all down quite a bit. And I don't think that I don't think people are just you know the health of our population has changed. People are 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 staying away out of concern and fear, but they will bounce back. And I think the more you can provide us the flexibility to do what we need to do. With you know, with appropriate safeguards and guardrails in place, and I, I think we we know we need to do that. I, I'm urging you to, to to trust us to do the right things and to continue to monitor us, and and we will stay close in contact with you. Each, each hospital will, and, and I'm, I'm I feel confident that we could we could respond to any request that you have. But in terms of developing a, a major full blown budget process, we just don't have the horsepower or the energy right now. So, um, you know, I, I view our relationship with the Green Mountain Care Board, even though you're our regulator, I think we've been partners in care. And I, I'm willing to, I, I'm certainly, I, I know the other hospitals feel the same, we'll continue that partnership. But this is a time for us to, to, to do things differently. And, and, and don't box us in a way that, you know, it's going to hurt the hospitals and it's going to hurt the community and the patients we're serving. So, um, again, I thank for what you guys are doing. It's a tough job. It is not an easy one. But, um, you know, we're going to get through this together. But um, I think we all need to cooperate and, and have some degree of trust and faith. And I know we need to verify, and we'll do that too. So thank you, Kevin, for what you're doing. Thank you, Tom. Steve. So I was raising my hand to try to, because uh, Tom was um, uh, having a technical problem on his computer. So, um, I'd just like to add what he said. Um, those 50 FTEs. It's always uh, good if you concur with your boss, Steve. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> right. But but I'll just add to the, the 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 50 FTEs. These are not new FTEs, as Tom said. Th these are redeployed people. These are people in our billing office working at the vaccine clinic. While they're not giving vaccine, they're they're registering people in the testing clinic. So we've redeployed. Um, a lot of uh, people, we do have some clinical people that have gone from the, the offices and the physician practices and now are now are uh, in the vaccine clinic or working in our respiratory evaluation center or on the, in the testing center. So um, there is there is and, and you know the organization is is trying to respond and um, you know uh, any relief we can get in some administrative burden, uh, we've internally here, knocked out a lot of administrative things because the, the most important thing today is taking care of our patients that are sick, testing people in the community, and getting vaccines in people's arms. And that those are, our, as well as, you know, any anybody else coming in, uh, getting the high quality care that we uh, provide. But uh, 
that's our focus. And um, uh, anything we can do to uh, uh, alleviate some administrative burden would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Steve. Um, next in the queue is Steve Gordon, and on deck will be Dean French. Steve. Yes, hey, Kevin and the board, really appreciate the opportunity to talk. I just want to uh, make a couple of comments, um, and I completely agree with uh, Claudio's points as well as Jeff and Tom D. But, you know, I want to go through a little deja vu with you all from what Patrick uh, presented and the staff presented a couple of meetings ago about how we ended uh, the fiscal year, this last fiscal year, the actuals. And throughout every, almost every hospital, you saw uh, major services um, uh, significantly below prior year and certainly below what we had budgeted to the tune of anywhere between 10 and 20 percent. I want to give you a little sense of where we are in Brattleboro, uh, you know, boots on the ground here, is we have not seen any kind of bounce back. Um, and unfortunately, we incurred, as you've seen the first quarter numbers, a $2 million loss. Uh, and the bigger question from my board is, Steve, what are we going to see for the rest of this year? Well, we are starting to see some level of improvement, um, but I got to tell you, we still have a real question of how fast and how um, effective um, uh, dealing with whatever we're calling this pent up demand or, or a backlog. I haven't seen any of that, to be very honest with you. Our ER is still down by 20% volume. Inpatient is down by 20%. We have a 5% drop in our medical office um, uh, visits, um, 40 to 45% drop in, in births here at the hospital. So um, we're looking at this thing and we're gonna end up, you know, we're close to um, uh, coming into our second quarter. And we always budget, as you know, we always budget for the, fir uh, for the next fiscal year based upon the actuals of the first two quarters. Well, if we budget to based on the first two quarters, I don't care what is set from an NPR, we've got a big, much bigger problem than that. I do see some you know, light at the end of the tunnel in terms of uh, improvement uh, starting in March. Now that we've been doing 250 vaccines a day, people are coming back to the hospital, the OR volume's up, births are up, but I don't really know ultimately how we're gonna end up for this fiscal year. So I'm trying to wrap my head around how are we going to approach this budget process with um, such an absolute unknown that, and I've been a hospital CEO for 40 years, and none of us have ever been through anything like this. So um, I look at this budget process. I really appreciate everything that Jessica ha has said about if you've seen one hospital in Vermont, that's all you've seen is that one hospital. Um, but I will tell you from, from the Brattleboro standpoint, it, it, to, to some degree, it'll be a shot in the dark um, because we just we don't know where it's ultimately going to go. And hopefully we get back to a better um, uh, base uh, in terms of volumes, in terms of revenues for uh, FY uh, 2022. But I it's it's like a crystal ball right now. I think there will certainly be improvement. My concern is we're not we don't see. Um, a lot of movement on the federal side. We got $11 million of CARES funding if we hadn't, uh, for last year. And if we hadn't gotten that, we would have had $11 million loss. Unprecedented, certainly in this hospital's uh, history, starting out in 1904. Um, so uh, you're going to balance it off as what the feds are going to come up with for rural hospitals. And there's some movement there. But as I said, there's just so much uncertainty. And I would hope that... Um, you know, you all take that into account um, as you continue these deliberations. Um, and I uh, do appreciate appreciate the opportunity to share with you my concerns uh, on behalf of, you know, the 600 employees here at Brattleboro. Thank you, Steve. And, and uh, we have great expectations that the feds will come forward for the rural hospitals based on conversations that have occurred to date. Um, but again, the proof will be in the pudding. With that, I'm going to move to Dean French, and I think, Dean, that this is the first time you've spoken to an actual official Green Mountain Care Board meeting, so I'd like to welcome you. I've been very impressed with uh, our meetings that we've had to date, and uh, we look forward to your comments. Dean. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. And, and as a relative newcomer, well, not relative, I am a newcomer to the state of Vermont, um, this has been a, an interesting journey, uh, and and 
in watching and listening to how the, we regulate and try to manage our healthcare environment in the state of Vermont. Um, there, there's some concerning uh, trends in the state of Vermont that predate the pandemic, whether it's decreasing margins across the healthcare system to the point of really threatening viability of some of our facilities, and also our overall outcomes uh, as you measure them from an acute care hospital standpoint are not really trending in the right direction if you look at the high level metrics, whether that's uh, CMS uh, hospital compare metrics or not. And I, and, I, and I would argue that Vermont should be leading one of the leading states in the country on those types of things. And yet the trend is not in the right direction. And, and, and that's a change from a few years ago. As I boil that down to Northwestern Medical Center, I see th th that we're a microcosm of the same issues. We've had a lot of distraction on focus on areas that are are really adjacent to our primary mission. Um, and then you bring in the pandemic. And so the points that all the speakers made previous, uh, the, the, they can't be understated overstated, sorry, uh, what the real impact of the pandemic has been on operations at facilities. We, like um, uh, my colleague at Southwestern, have been an incident command nonstop. We've had, we still have redeployed staff to support vaccine clinic, drive-through testing, you name it. And, and I'm looking ahead at the budget process going, okay, how do we try to normalize our operations and regain our focus on access, on care coordination, on eliminating hospital-acquired conditions and serious safety events and surgical site infections and get our observed versus expected mortality back where it should be. And how do we get our patient satisfaction in the top quartile in the United States? And how do we decrease our costs per beneficiary? All the things that drive us to be a five-star CMS facility. And, and in the face of a fatigued leadership team and a very fatigued staff. Um, I, I think, you know, there's lots of pressing needs in Northwest Vermont with our community, but we can't be the sole answer to our community's social ills. We should be a leader and a facilitator of a community-wide discussion about those social determinants of health that are barriers in, in Northwest Vermont. And ideally, I'd like to see where Northwestern takes a lead position in, in becoming an incubator and pr providing an incubation process for experimentation and how we start resolving our social, social economic issues that, that create the health issues that we see in our community. Having said all that, I, I, I wish that's where our conversations were more than they are currently in the regulatory environment. I really appreciate Jessica's thought process. You know, a presumptive uh, approval based on some high level metrics would be remarkably useful this year. We are all tired and um, we could use that relief. So uh, I, I appreciate your efforts as, as the Green Mountain Care Board and I appreciate my colleagues input. I hope I made some sense and I'll, I'll leave my remarks there. Thank you, Dean. I'm not seeing any more hands, but I'll uh, put one more call out. Oh, I say that and a hand went up. Um, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, good afternoon uh, to the uh, Green Mountain Care Board and the staff. Um, I'm Mike Halstead, and I'm the current CEO of Springfield Hospital. Um, and many of you know about Springfield. Uh, you've been... Uh, very attuned to what has been happening over the last couple of years. <clears throat> and I um, I will be brief. Uh, I don't want to appear uh, to maybe be myopic in terms of just our uh, particular situation, but I, I just wanted to let give you a perspective. Um, we did spend um, almost 18 months in bankruptcy. Uh, we are out of bankruptcy now as of January 1st. Um, it was a result of a lot of hard work um, by people at this hospital, as well as some luck. Um, and it takes it always takes a little bit of, of both of that. But we are out of bankruptcy now. 
Um, and, and my perspective is, uh, and again, it could be just this particular facility, but with all due respect uh, to the Green Mountain Care Board and what you're trying to do, um, I got to tell you from my perspective, I don't worry about the NPR. What I worry about is making sure that our facility is operating at the lowest cost it possibly can uh, because we are needed in this community. And, and we have to generate enough revenue uh, to cover that cost. The unfortunate position that we find ourselves in um, is we have to generate a little bit more than just our cost um, because we have a commitment that we have to make to reinvesting in this facility that hasn't been done for years. Um, and, and I don't know whose fault that is. I don't want to uh, point blame at anybody. Uh, but that's the situation that we face. Um, and, and so um, my perspective is uh, I'm not sure to us how important the NPR is. Uh, what's really important to us is to be sure that, um, and, and we work on this every day, that our operating costs um, are sufficient um, to cover uh, what we have to do here, what the community is looking for us to do. It's basic primary care, rural hospital type services that we're providing, and that's all we're providing. Um, and and so um, that's my perspective, and I appreciate you listening, and I, and I thank you for all the hours and hours and hours that you put in um, trying to do what you're trying to, to do for the state of Vermont. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and I want to uh, publicly thank you for the, your service to uh, the Springfield Hospital at a, a really uh, trying time in their history. And, um, you know, many people would not have predicted that you would have emerged from bankruptcy two years ago, and you have, and um, we all hope that you have a bright future. And uh, so thank you for your service, Mike. I know you came out of retirement to, you know, um, Make sure that the, the, the ship didn't sink and you succeeded in that uh, mission, so thank you. Is there other public comment? Uh, Isabel. Yes, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Isabel Desjardins. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at UVM Medical Center. It's nice to have the opportunity to um, uh, bring the voice and the face of the clinicians at UVM Medical Center to the Green Mountain Care Board this afternoon. I just wanted to perhaps uh, contribute to some of the questions that uh, were raised earlier when it pertains to the uh, pent-up demand or the expected pent-up demand in the next year. Uh, we're seeing also lower volumes, but we're also what we're seeing right now is people come into the hospital much sicker than they used to before our um, case, mis in, case mix index is uh, gradually going up as well as our percentage of admissions from uh, our emergency department um, has increased year over year very significantly. And that is um, regardless of whether the individuals have uh, are suffering from COVID or not. So we're seeing a 10% increase in the patients that we admit from our emergency room uh, to the hospital. So um, I highly anticipate um, an increase in demand in uh, fiscal year 22 with um, a greater proportion of individuals that have complex illnesses that um, have not been addressed and uh, come in with a more complicated clinical presentations. So that's point number one. In terms of the COVID road ahead, if you will, um, I do not believe that the impact of COVID pandemic is over from a hospital standpoint. Uh, we were the first to be impacted and we sure will be the last one to the last ones to get relief uh, from the impact of it. Uh, uh, with the vaccination, certainly the morbidity of the disease will decrease significantly, but it, um, the, the mortality will decrease significantly, but I do not believe that the um, morbidity will um, uh, go away. So we will continue to have to take care of individuals with COVID. Um, the uh, variant 
uh, is an unknown. And moreover, we don't know what's going to happen with the need for vaccine boosters. And that's going to be another ball of wax, if you will. Um, I wanted to also um, uh, build on what Mr. French um, uh, commented on in regards to the, the, the conversations that is being um, taking place at, at this level uh, in um, really not talking about uh, outcomes of quality, patient safety, and um, uh, levels of experience uh, for um, all served in the system. Um, what I've observed in the three years that I've served as chief medical officer is that the gradual narrowing of our margins over time is impacting um, our ability to maintain um, uh, our clinical infrastructure and keep up with um, what is expected of us as a academic medical center. Um, really, um, this is not true 10 years ago, but it is true now. Any investment that we're not making today is de facto putting us back three years in terms of keeping up with the advancements, um, technology, clinical expectations, and performance expectations as an academic medical center. So I would ask that you take that in consideration in your, um, in your framework for budgeting purposes. Lastly, um, I want, to on, uh, I want to emphasize the impact on our people of this pandemic. Um, I'm not going to mince my words. People are fried and we need a break. So um, uh, I think that I really appreciate your, your consideration for, for that. And um, uh, it's been a tough year for everybody um, uh, in, in the clinical realm. So thank you. Thank you. Is there other public comment? Carol? Yes, thank you. I just want to reiterate what the doctor just said, uh, specifically around the caregivers. Um, I made a note in the chat box, but I'll take the opportunity to say it. Um, there's a significant unknown uh, degree to which our heroic caregivers are going to recover physically or emotionally. Studies uh, are already showing high degrees of PTSD, moral distress, and the long tail of disillusionment on the resilience spectrum. And so organizations are going to have to prioritize that work as well as the mental health needs of our, of our patients and our community. So uh, it's just going, it's going to be an added burden and I can't stress enough um, the profound impact on healthcare workers. Thank you. Thank you. And I see that Dale has raised his hand again, Dale. Yes, the only reason I did that is because of the last two comments and I think I can add something to that as an, I, my daughter's family out in Colorado, all four of them have had COVID, or they either are over or still fighting it. And I was just talking with my daughter last night, the first chance I got to really have a long conversation with her, what it's like to be a mom of a family that has had COVID. Her first comment was, I am scared. Like I have never been scared before and she doesn't know what to expect. She's asking questions like, do I get a vaccine three months from now because I've had COVID? What's the long-term ramifications for health for all four of them? Her youngest son still can't smell, still can't taste, still has a burning sensation in his nose. She has the same thing, no taste, no smell, burning sensation in the nose. Um, she got strep and she had COVID at the same time. And yet she's trying to uphold and do everything she can. And one comment that really stuck with me is, I have been so scared, more scared now than ever in my life, but I couldn't show it because my family needed me and I had to carry forward. That PTSD, that I mean, 
I couldn't help but think of all the ramifications of what this is in terms of doctor's appointments, health care, going forward for just that one family that has had COVID, that came home from school, nothing could be done. They did everything they could to not get it. She even shared with me that she asked the doctor, how is it when we took so many precautions, we got it, and people that take less precautions didn't get it. And he said, disease doesn't favor what you do. It's just luck, whether you get it or not. In other words, it can help, but it doesn't mean you aren't gonna get it. So those two people that just spoke, please take to heart what they said, because I think they understated the issue as to what's gonna be coming at us. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Is there other public comment? Hearing none, is there further board discussion? So I just wanted to um, share a couple of reactions um, and I have a couple of questions that I don't know who it would be appropriate for, but I would throw them out there. And that is um, to address uh, Jeff's point around suspension of the of the process. For me personally, the level of uncertainty is why suspension just seems unrealistic. Um, and I know you can certainly argue that because of the uncertainty, perhaps the process is less meaningful. But we do have a statutory responsibility. And while we certainly have the ability to tailor that this year because of our special COVID authority, you know, I don't really think it was meant to extend to completely suspending the process. That's my personal opinion, um, having been involved in the legislative discussion. So for me, that was a step too far. In terms of simplification, uh, as I have said repeatedly, I am certainly interested and open to that conversation. Uh, here are the ways that I think we have already proposed in the staff recommendation to simplify. Uh, there's been a waiver in, in the proposal of the non-financial reporting and to uh, Dr. French and Desjardins comments, usually we collect quality and have a quality discussion as part of the process, but in order to simplify, we the proposal is to waive that this year and keep it strictly financial and not looking at access or quality in order to streamline. Um, second of all, the, the adaptive submission, uh, which, you know, I haven't used adaptive, so I don't pretend to understand uh, how complicated or simple that software is to use, but uh, the current proposal is to keep that submission at the higher level, similar to the types of things that you're already preparing for your boards of directors, balance sheets, income statements, that kind of thing. Um, and I very much appreciate the specific comments on the workbook from Mark Stanislav, because certainly I think if there were areas in the workbook that people felt like um, could be streamlined, this would be good information for us to have. No one other than Mark has provided that information. Um, I, and then I think, um, you know, our current discussion around how do we set a trigger for a, a presumptive approval, I think is also an attempt. Um, I would love to hear more what minimizing the Q&A means because I'm certainly interested in that. I just don't know what that means exactly from a hospital perspective and how that would get memorialized in the guidance. So my question is, uh, I would love to have more concrete suggestions around that. And I also just want to thank both Mark and the folks at Gifford for the concrete suggestions that they provided in their comments their written comments, because that was super helpful. Kevin, can I build on the Q&A component that Robin just raised, or do you want me to hold off on that? You can. I was just waiting to see if there any hands rose. Uh, oh, OK. Yep. Didn't. So go ahead, Jess. OK, I was just thinking that um, my understanding is that the back and forth after the submission prior to the hearing can be administratively burdensome and onerous. 
Um, and in light of all that we just heard from the hospitals and um, with respect to Robin's question about q and A, I too would like to hear more about that, but I was gonna throw out a possibility, which would be, um, so hospitals that are submitting their budgets the the questions that would come prior to the hearing would be largely clarifying questions if some data points don't tie out if there's some misunderstanding you know if this our our staff can't understand some component it doesn't tie out to some table some clarifications but other questions would be reserved for the hearing but another thought would be typically our board members are the only ones that ask questions at the hearing so and the healthcare advocate of course um, I'm thinking we could roll in hospital budget team questions as well, but save it for the hearing, and that would eliminate some of the back and forth that happens, you know, in in the between process. So that was a thought that I had that I was going to bring forward um, to reduce some of the administrative burden. But it would require, uh, you know, an understanding of what is a clarifying kind of question, and probably in, involve having the hospital budget team involved in our hearing process more directly. So to speak directly to that point. This is something that I've uh, expressed in the past in that um, questions should be posed to the hospitals up front. And what has happened too often is board members have chosen to ask new questions as um, at the hearing date and as follow-up questions. And that's what's really got to stop um, during these uncertain times. This has to be a simplified process. It, it can't be... Um, um, the way it's been done in the past where people get a second shot. And um, I do see a hand up from a hospital that may be able to address questions that uh, Robin and Jess have raised. So Claudio, is that your intent? Uh, yeah, but it might not be the outcome, uh, Mr. Chairperson. Um, so I, I can't speak to the specifics. I can speak to the fact that as you heard from some of the folks here on the front lines, here at the hospitals, we've had to rethink and conduct our business very differently than we ever had before. We had to figure it out on the fly. If we didn't, Vermont wouldn't be leading this, the nation in you know, figuring out how to do testing and how to get people vaccinations in arms. And the challenge is from our perspective with these resources, is, you know, we kind of think, oh, once we get over, you know, once we get to this point in time, we'll be able to take a breather and move. There's no breather for us. You know, we are going to go right from crisis to response to how do we now segue back to normal operations? And there's dozens, if not hundreds of decisions we got to figure out on how to um, restore those operations. And our people haven't had a break. You know, Judy Fox and the finance team have had no downtime. And now I'm asking her, Judy, at what point do we now close down the mass vaccination clinic at the Holiday Inn here in Rutland and bring it back in house? Do some analysis for that. Judy, what do we do about all the pent up CTO time, uh, paid time off that staff have? How do we manage that over the summer when, you know, how do we do all these things? That's just what we're trying to say. And our only, I don't know the specifics, Member Lunge, but you know, our, my team would tell you, but my only appeal is that we would just ask the Green Mountain Care Board not to conduct business as usual in your oversight and regu regulation. Like Tom said, we accept the fact that the structure's in place. We try to meet the, the guidelines and requirements in good faith that you put out for us. And I know Judy and I know the finance team, you put that out and it's gonna be hard for them just to say, oh, well, we blew through that. It's just not how we're wired. So that's my only thing, if you can just hear us and um, you know, this is an atypical year. And I know, uh, Member Usifer, you were saying, how do we, you know, that impacts next year's budget. Will we be back at the same thing? We might. I, I don't know. It depends how this year goes. I know we're, but there's going to be a tail on how we segue back into normal operations. Thank you, Claudio. Is there any other uh, person that wishes to speak at this time? Any board member discussion? Does any board member wish to make a motion or do you want to sit on this? 
Well, I wonder if we should continue through. Well, I mean, I guess there's two ways that I, I think I could see this going. I think we could continue through this, the next steps of the slide and then the analysis the staff did around charge, and then we could come back and then, and also like the hearing parameters, because if, if there is the will to do this concept that just put out there around, we set guardrails with presumptive approval. I think we need to have thought through all of those components together. Um, so I think we could do that, or we could start with just a, whether that conceptually is the way we're gonna go and sort of figure that out. I don't know, so, I'm open to, to moving forward in either way, whatever works for, for folks. But I think we should still, I think we have still have a little more discussion we can do today to get a little further along. Well, I think yeah. there's a lot more discussion that's gonna to occur today. Um, I, I agree with Robin, I think it would be good to kind of, um, I think some of these are, are go hand in hand. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sure we're gonna have a similar conversation on, you know, do we do anything with rate or not? Um, do we look at waiving um, meetings and what would those parameters be? So even though it seems like it might extend it, I think it might actually help us close it if we kind of go through those other discussions too. Okay, Before we unless I hear otherwise, I'm gonna proceed uh, with Patrick's discussion of the next uh, slides. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I was going to suggest after all of the uh, board dialogue and feedback that maybe we adjust our um, approach here slightly. So um, if it's OK with the <clears throat> board, perhaps we can uh, navigate through the charge discussion and potentially enforcement and the exemption piece. And then you can wrap your conversation up. Um, to include NPR, because I agree with the board members. I think it's it's all much closer tied than viewing it in individual vacuums. So with your permission, I'd like to proceed with that <coughs> in mind. Proceed. Thank you. All right, so with change in charge, um, as you remember from our NPR discussion, we do a lot of uh, five-year looks. So we wanted to encompass that over a couple of different variants here. Um, in dialing in the staff's consideration. Now, we've had a lot of conversation here in the last hour or so, so I'm expecting this to change as well, but we were asked to come here with a, a recommendation, so we've done that for the board. So the first slide, this one and the next one you're gonna see, the important thing to remember here is this includes UVM's approved commercial effective rates as we've known them over the last few years. So you'll note on this page specifically for fiscal year 21 that Porter has a 4% commercial effective rate approval. So what we're going to do is we're going to provide you a couple of different looks chronologically and then with UVM's effective rates and then with charging grow, overall charge increases built in. So you're going to get a feel for um, the variability there. <clears throat> so as I stated, we have two looks here. We have fiscal year 17 through 21, which we have discussed has some higher rates than in past years based on um, COVID activity that um, the hospitals were budgeting for in 2021, or perhaps not budgeting for, depending on the circumstance. So we provided a five-year average for that and a five-year median for that. On to the next slide, slide 13, We've extracted 21 in the event the board members want to say, hey, that was a one-off. It doesn't really impact my view of um, the decisions that have been made over, over the course of time prior to uh, the pandemic. So again, this includes UVM's commercial effectives rate, but we are pulling out fiscal year 21 and we're backing up the chronology to 2016 instead. So 2016 to 2020 with UVM's commercial effective rates built in. You get a five-year average <clears throat> um, and you get a five-year median. So you can see the different approaches there as well. Shifting a bit, this slide and the next slide will follow that same chronological order, um, inclusive of 21 and non-inclusive of 21. And <clears throat> this actually includes those overall rates. So again, as I discussed with Porter, because that's an obvious example, they had a 4% commercial effective rate. And you can see here in 2021, their overall rate request to increase their charges was 0%. So 
So we've done the same thing. We've applied a five-year average and a five-year median to keep consistent some of those reportings that we have done in the past. And we feel that that highlights the various decisions um, across a few different iterations of the board. But nonetheless, the data is in front of you. <clears throat> so again, here we have the overall rate, and you can see how when we include those overall rates where zeros have been applied and 2020 is the end piece with 21 out, those averages and, if, and medians come down significantly from um, inclusiveness of 2021. This piece here we put in for board member Yusufer because she wanted us to show for possible discussion points how rates um, shook out last year and because 2021 was its own uh, special year for trying to approach um, budgeting and charges. We wanted to break this out for her in the, in the event that she wanted to discuss this particular point further. So what we've done is we've um, provided for the board kind of the base rate and then the allowance that the board made an adjustment for uh, when they rounded out the decisions. The whole picture is the combination of these two. So looking at Northwestern Medical Center on slide 16, their total approved charge for 2021 was 13%. 10% of it was kind of a base and the other 3% was the board allowance that they gave on top of that. <clears throat> so continuing with our methodology here at the top on slide 17, you have your medians and your averages for the system. And then we broke it out by hospital designation in the event folks wanted to see how it shook out across designation. And then we've broken it out um, with UVM's commercial effective rates built into those figures and then with the overall rates used. And we have adopted 17 to 21 from the staff's perspective because regardless of the fact that we may want to carve out 21, it does exist within the ultimate numbers when we look back at this historically. So we felt it was important to include that. And you can see um, <clears throat> with the medians, um, there's not a whole lot of movement going on um, with commercial rates or with overall charges. The averages, of course, are affected because if Porter receives 4%, it's built into that average. And if they receive 0%, um, <clears throat> it's, it's going to be ruled out as an outlier. So um, you can see some of the figures here as far as dialing in a data point. And so with that, we looked at those figures and our recommendation prior to this meeting today, based on the request from the board, would be a 4% charge ceiling as we left it last week. And that considers the rates approved in 21, using the median charge request to remove those significant outliers where they exist. But we also wanted to add a couple of other options that maybe you choose to um, designate a ceiling based on the hospital's designation of critical access or, or prospective payment. And that we have dialed in based on that information at 4% or 3.5%, should you choose to accept it. And then also as a final option, um, and this has come up already in this discussion, is making the change in charge ceiling only for those hospitals um, who may want exemption. So you could set that ceiling and then let everyone else bring in what they want. But those hospitals who accept the ceiling that you've put forth, um, that would be one component towards the exemption policy that we'll talk about in a little bit. The next piece here is we have a standing enforcement policy. There's been no changes on that as um, legal discussed last week. However, that may also dovetail into your logic as you think through your NPR, your charge, and your exemption policies because ultimately um, enforcement can um, be a component, regulatory component within all of that but with all of the unknowns that have just been discussed here today, it's probably pertinent that that gets woven into this overall discussion and isn't uh, particularly done in, in its own uh, vacuum. <clears throat> so part of that is it is standing enforcement policy and the board may adopt that policy still um, and waive enforcement at a later date. So if you choose to accept the policy, then it is in place and then you can make your decision at another point in time on that particular component of the discussion today. So moving forward to the exemption discussion, um, we've put up here on the screen <clears throat> uh, some of the considerations from the current existing 
exemption from hearing policy. And I won't read through all of these because they've been posted and board members have had a chance to read through them, but we wanted to put them here as a point of reference as we work towards the next piece, which is the um, staff recommendation based on the discussion from around exemption from last week's meeting. However, before we get there, um, I'd like to turn it over to a member of our legal counsel, Russ McCracken, to talk about process uh, because there, there are some items here when we get down to staff recommendations um, that may um, need to be evolved with the existing process. So Russ, uh, I hope you're still with us and I anticipate you are. So I'll turn it over to you to discuss the process around public hearing and some of the recommendations we have below. I will speak, uh, just briefly here to frame <clears throat> how a potential exemption process would work within the existing rule and the authority that the board has. Um, I want to note uh, that under Rule 3.304, um, there is a, an existing procedure for exemption to public hospital budget hearings. Uh, but the way that rule works and the limitations included in that are um, likely too limited for what the board is looking at here. Um, specifically, the rule says that only four hospitals in any year can have their um, public hearings waived, and none of the four largest hospitals in the state can have their public hearings waived. They're simply not eligible for that process under the rule. Um, so to move away from the limitations um, that are contained in 3304, um, the board could utilize its Act 91 authority um, to create an exemption process um, to waive parts of the rule to ensure um, an orderly regulatory um, procedure here. Um, specifically, it would be getting rid of those two limitations that are noted on the slide and also setting up the additional criteria uh, for having an exemption to the um, public budget hearing. Uh, last note here, or additional note here, hospitals that are exempt from the hearing um, will not have their budgets adjusted. And as a point of clarification on that, the language you see on the slide comes from Rule 3304. And it means that if a hospital submits a budget meeting the criteria set by the board for exemption, uh, the hospital would not be required to have a public hearing and the board would not order any adjustments to that hospital's budget. Um, in other words, that the hospital budget would be approved as presented. Um, and just to clarify, it doesn't prevent a hospital from subsequently asking for a modification to its approved budget um, as uh, hospitals would typically have that um, ability to do and using that, that normal process. <clears throat> um, so with that, uh, Patrick, do you want to go through the proposed criteria, um, or would you like me to do that? No, I'm happy to do that. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Russ. Uh, so we lead off our criteria here piece with something that needs to be considered that we really couldn't uh, do without Russ's discussion um, and the board's Act 91 authority. So that's considering whether the exemption would be open to all hospitals or whether the largest hospitals um, should have their hearings. So that's, as part of our recommendation, couldn't really be a factor based on that process that still is yet to occur. So with that, you'll note that the NPR rate request and charge increase request, um, what we've put in here are our recommendations um, following the discussion today and a couple of other financial metrics, as we heard from board members last week, that they, they might wanna consider as part of this would be, um, as we've laid out days cash on hand at or above the median for the system. So we wanna understand um, their liquidity and ability to absorb um, perhaps some ups and downs as have, has been discussed here today. And also um, whether or not they're operating margin can be budgeted to a positive. And yes, we understand that um, there's so much unknown out there. Budgeting is going to be a near impossible request. But if there, if, if the board were to adopt this NPR and charge increase, can the hospital still come in with a positive margin? And that's out of consideration for their ability to operate above water for the year. Um, in addition to that, 
We would like to see continued involvement in value-based care reform, and we put not limited the ACO. We are understanding that hospitals do have other value-based contracts, and we think that is um, valid, that are not operated within um, the context of One Care Vermont. Um, and then we have some items up next around the budget assumptions are deemed reasonable. That comes out of the existing rule. Um, budget submissions reconcile and the content complies with guidance. So those all come out of that initial rule in either exact terms or lesser than exact terms. And then finally, from a logistics perspective, we would need to decide as a regulatory body <clears throat> what the deadline for pre-approval would be. And we're floating the July 28th deadline around when the staff normally, with last year's exception, presents the budget submissions to the board. Um, you have rate review to consider in the month of July, and we certainly don't want to overload that process, um, but we usually have a placeholder in late July to present the preliminary budget presentations to you, and that may be an opportune time so that we have enough advance notice for the hospitals you may want to exempt that they don't have to prepare their presentation for mid-August. So we wanted to take that into consideration as well when making this recommendation. And that's, that uh, ends the discussion on change in charge, the enforcement policy and potential exemption. And the rest of the language here is around potential um, motion language for the exemption and the overall guidance. Um, but we'll turn it back over to the board to discuss those topics. So thank you, Patty. And uh, maybe it would be good if we just took a straw poll at this point in time. Um, on whether or not um, there's interest by the board to allow for the uh, presumptive approval process, which would require using language under Act 91 and um, waiving aspects of the current rule that is in place for that uh, um, waiver of hearing. I, for one, um, would support a process that would allow for a waiver of hearing. Um, I would not support a process at um, a 4% uh, threshold of uh, change in charges. I think that's too high um, without having someone come in and explain why they need that. And so, um, but the concept itself, I'm not opposed to, and I'm curious what other board members are thinking there. So, um, <clears throat> I, I could support a process that um, is, uh, you know, that 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 is very truncated in the near term. Um, it's clear to me that there is so much that we don't know um, that we have tired troops out there in the field, and that we should, as much as possible, kind of use this process to establish some performance standards. Um, that are important to us uh, in terms of affordability, the NPR number, in terms of solvency, uh, cat, <clears throat> days cash or margins, um, or, um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, for me, reform uh, an FPP number, so that, that we're basically kind of looking to the future, which is very foggy at this point in time, but we're looking to the future and saying, these underlying metrics are important to us, but we don't have the um, the uh, the information and the certainty that we need to make more nuanced decisions. And so, um, if if we were to say, here are these performance standards, you know that that we're looking to, um, and uh, if if a hospital will agree to those. Um, which which kind of shapes the forward view, then we would allow um, uh, without a lot of work on the part of the hospital to get, you know, whatever uh, increase uh, we decide is uh, where we want to go in terms of um, NPR and some you know basic thresholds having to do with solvency. So um, you know, there's I, I can't see any rational way out of the situation that we're in now in terms of of using um, an information process and a hearings and all of the requests that we've made of hospitals 
that's going to get us much. Um, we need more time for things to sugar off. And so, um, and, but we also have to abide by the fact that hospitals need to sit down with the insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera, and negotiate. So um, if, if we're in a 3%, 2.5%, 3%, 3.5% world, let's just keep it simple and go with that, understanding that it's a placeholder until we get uh, to a time forward where things are more clear. Other board members? Um, well, I, I'll jump in and say, obviously, I think I, I'm supportive of this, um, this presumptive approval process. Um, I would limit the, the, um, the parameters to the rate request, the NPR FPP rate request under the, you know, under a particular ceiling and the charge increase request. Um, I, I would add, I guess I would add that the the operating margin should be budgeted as positive. I agree with that point. My concern about the day's cash on hand at or above the median for the system, by definition, if I understand that means that half the hospitals would be ineligible if that's a criteria um, to be included in this. So if we wanna look at day's cash on hand, I think we need some absolute number, not a median number because half of them will be above and half of them will be below. And if we're using that as a criteria, we've automatically just assumed that half cannot participate. <laughs> so that one doesn't quite work for me, um, but uh, I'm supportive of it. I think what we decide on those parameters will be the next part of the conversation, perhaps if others agree with this process. But I think in this era of, of uncertainty, administrative burden, burnout, and all that we just heard, I think this is a, a way forward. Other board members? Uh, sure, I'll go. Um, I can get my, I can, I can get comfortable with, with waiving um, the meetings, although I would put, um, you know, put in their submission if, if a hospital wants to come in, it's approved, right? If we if they hit these parameters, but if they want to come in to meet with us, um, and I think some may want to come in to be able to tell their story, to be able to talk about their risk and opportunities and things like that. I mean, my preference would be that they that they do, and that we give them, you know, that it's like half the amount of time that we normally would have. And that you know they know when they come in, it is they are approved, and I think we're still going to be zooming, so it makes it a little bit easier. They don't have to drive. But um, if people didn't want to put that in and didn't feel strongly about that, I, I can get my arms wrapped around on the on the full waiver. Um, just one point on the charge, uh, which I know we'll discuss in a bit. Um, you know, last year the lowest that was approved was 3.2 by grace and everybody else was at or above 3.5. So we may think four is high, but if, if we're going to get into that waiver range, you know, I think it's got to be three and a half or north of there, um, you know, because nobody would have qualified last year. So I, I think we just need to look at that. And I know last year was, we had some issues, but we still have those issues going into next year. Um, but I'll just, you know, we're going to get into the rate discussion, so we don't have to align on that. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew where things shook out last year by individual hospital. And, you know, there were several that we approved straight up what they requested. Um, but those were all in the kind of three, six to four range, um, last year. So just, just as a data point, but, um, I could get, you know, I think we should at least put the option that if a hospital wants to come in with this, they can, but it would be, you know, they would be approved. Maybe we don't require that. I'm also okay on, you know, we, we always look at the day's cash on hand and the operating margins and things like that, but that hasn't necessarily been the driver in our decision. So I, I'm okay with not putting those in a waiver because I think, um, you know, in a, a hospital might come in with a they maybe they have a negative operating margin but it's because they received maybe they budgeted a negative operating margin but it's really but their balance sheet looks really strong because they 
you know, got some money and they didn't have to pay it back and, and it put them in a stronger position. And so for some reason, maybe they would be negative. But, you know, I think the intent of all the hospitals, um, and if we look historically, they do budget for a positive margin. Um, it ends up being negative for other reasons. So, so the budgets, you know, the budgets probably would all be positive, but at the end of the day, uh, we'd be back looking at what really happened. And when many of them go in the red, it's it's not because that's how they budgeted it. So, so just to uh, jump in on that, Maureen, um, the reason why I I don't think um, a presumptive approval should be granted on four uh, percent is exactly. Um, the point that you brought up that last year they were higher than that. The reason why many were higher than that last year is we erred on the side of sustainability. We needed to keep our hospital system afloat. And um, originally we had intended to have a bifurcated rate um, because of what uh, took place um, in Washington, that plan um, quickly changed and everything was turned into one rate increase and to give 4% presumptively without even going through uh, the, the thorough uh, review and discussion on top of some of those that came in high last year, I, I think is just inappropriate because again, it just moves that base higher moving forward and will always be baked into the system. Um, yeah, and I, I do think on the when we get back to the charge discussion, there is that topic of, um, do we, what consideration, if anything, do we do for those hospitals that got extra above the four percent, you know, above uh, above even a four percent rate last year, you know, but who, who ended up getting some COVID, what we would consider COVID related extra money. But but that's okay. I guess we can defer till we talk, you know, get other people's perspective on rate as well. Okay, I think the only one who hasn't weighed in yet is Robin. Yeah, um I'm I, as I've already said, I like the concept of the presumptive approval and hearing waiver. Um, like Maureen, if people wanted to come in and talk, understanding that their budget was already approved, this was just informational, I, I'm fine with that, but I would leave, as Maureen said, that up to the hospital's choice. Um, and uh, Patrick, can you go back to the previous slide with the parameters? Oh, sorry, must be more than one. There we go. Um, so I think the other piece of of um, the criteria we need to sort out in addition to like the metrics um, are some of these other pieces. And so I would personally have the exemption open to all hospitals um, because I think everybody's in the same boat this year with the exhaustion and uncertainty. Um, and I, I'm kind of open on the other metrics. I can see why, why having to to Jess's point, I think it does would make sense if we do include days cash to have it be a, an amount and not so that we're not presumptively taking it off the table for half the folks. Um, so I could see two things, either having some those two pieces in or excluding them, but understanding that in our monitoring, if things were looking worrisome, like with anything, um, we would ask, you know, we would call people in to really talk through about anything that was worrisome in the, in the, um, the, the reporting. So I, I'm not sure where I land on that yet. I'm interested in other people's perspective on that. To me, the two key pieces are the NPR and charge. Um, and I think uh, the, the 28th makes, I, that sounds good to me since we would be doing preliminary budget presentations that time anyway. Although I love, you know, if that I'd love to get some feedback from the hospitals in terms of the timing of that versus when they would be preparing their presentations and that kind of thing. So I guess to summarize conceptually, yes, I'd apply it to all. I'm not exactly clear on the specifics of the metrics other than NPR in charge and the 28th looks good. So thank you, Bob. 
for uh, rounding out that uh, discussion because uh, we kind of glossed over some of those other points. And I think it uh, it is important that uh, we weigh in on those other points as well, because like you, I believe very strongly that if you, if one hospital is given the opportunity, all hospitals should be given the opportunity. And so I think that uh, we would need to waive our own rule when it came to that. And I think that's uh, very important. I do think that the um, July 28th deadline is important because anything beyond that um, really would be unfair um, to put so much pressure on um, already pressured staffs to uh, prepare for a hearing. And um, it's not on this particular slide, but one slide had proposed um, uh, possibly having different rates for uh, PPS versus uh, cause. And um, the reason why I, I don't support that is as you look at what the charges are for um, a number of procedures around the state, um, and this was highlighted in a Burlington Free Press article um, recently, some of the most expensive hospitals are our critical access hospitals, and they're expensive for a reason. They're, they're expensive because if you're in Newport, it's pretty hard to drive someplace else. And so even though they don't have the volumes of other hospitals, Past regulation, regulatory decisions have deemed that it's essential to that area and have allowed for those higher rates to be to be charged. And so, but to, to give um, a blanket um, higher um, presumptive approval increase um, to critical access hospitals across the board, I think is a mistake um, based on the fact that some of them already have some of the highest charges. And I think they have to come in and talk about why they would need that. And it's important to, to have that conversation. So I would not like to see um, different um, rates between the, the types of hospitals in terms of uh, allowing for that uh, um, presumptive approval. Other board members? Um, I, I agree, Kevin, that it should be open to all hospitals, not just a subset of them. Um, the 28th is perfectly fine with me. I would consider a flat rate as well. I don't think we know all the implications of chart having a different rate for, you know, PPS versus critical access. We just haven't gone down that path and I wouldn't want to do that on the fly. So um, I hope that that answers. And I think for the rest of the criteria here in terms of Budget assumptions are deemed reasonable. Budget submission schedules reconciled. Budget content complies with guidance. Uh, they all seem fine to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm OK with um, all those other components as well and not, you know, doing different rates for the two, you know, for different hospital classifications. Um, I'll throw out there <laughs> that you know, one, one thing that could be done under the charge um, increase would be considering, you know, hospitals that did get uh, incremental last year, maybe they're 1% less or something like that, you know, so it, it it is taking some type of recognition for the fact that we gave a higher rate the year before with the intent that it may be temporary, and this is for the waiver process. So just something to think about there. Do we give everybody the same or the, you know, seven hospitals that received extra money for COVID um, and for the most part, which was, you know, two, two and a half, three percent, do we do some type of consideration to say it's one percent less? And I think that the reason I throw that out there to kind of balance is a little bit of fairness into what hospitals received this year, which some of them were very high. And then if everyone were to get the same next year to start off for a waiver process, you know, um, is that the right thing? Or, you know, do we want those hospitals to come in? So I would just throw that out. Other board members? Mm -hmm. 
Is the preference to take a stab at a motion today, or is it the preference of the board to um, mull this over and come back next Wednesday to uh, um, try to get through all the remaining pieces? Well, I would love some public comment on what we just discussed, um, and that I think would help me get to a point to, to I mean, we may be able to get to a point where we can at least vote on the structure, meaning the presumptive, the presumptive piece we were just discussing, even if and with without necessarily filling in the blanks for the NPR in charge, which may be sort of the harder part to come to consensus on. See, I I just have a contrarian viewpoint on that, Robin, okay. because yep. there's no way that I would support um, a presumptive process if the if the charge was it's higher high. than I felt okay. uh, yeah. was appropriate for yeah. for I think that a presumptive approval requires less than what we envision the overall um, system is going to occur. Um, so when I look at a presumptive approval process, I'm I'm looking at something less than um, what I expect um, others. Uh, might be asking for at this point in time. So, it, and again, I might be in the minority and, and uh, you know, I'll accept that. I realize that. <laughs> no, I think you have a good point. I think we need to um, have some type of, you know, the, we haven't really gotten into any specifics on the rate discussion. So I think having, you know, we need to probably have that because you make a good point, you could approve this, and then all of a sudden, we yeah. collectively or three of the four, you know, we pop in a higher rate than maybe you would be comfortable with. Um, it, you know, so that's a fair point to say it's it's hard to approve the that without those components in there because that would influence the decision. I mean, one uh, one question I'd like to ask Patrick is. Uh, you know, seeing kind of the road that we're going down right now um, from a information submission perspective, uh, are there opportunities kind of, you know, like for adaptive, et cetera, um, there's certain essentials that you need over time. And, uh, you know, um, how, how would you see us going forward in that regard, just to make sure that the core information that we need to you build a bridge from you know 21 to 20 uh, to um, that you have what you need to do it from a just a staffing point of view. Well, I'll ask uh, Lori Perry, who maintains that database, to weigh in. Um, <clears throat> but I certainly think we need the adaptive submission components that we've laid out in the guidance under the adaptive submission and that is primarily your income statement your balance sheet your payer mix um, and we have also we put back in staffing and capital uh, plans you may be able to waive those latter two um, on that um, and then we really need to maintain some of those points on basic financial information in order to maintain our records and we could even revisit the appendices as well if the board feels that the charge work that we did this year is important along with understanding covid monies and uh, the carve out for vaccine clinics we could cut it to that as well uh, we have options that's part of the benefit of putting a little more in than um maybe the ultimate decision comes down to. Uh, but for adaptive, we would definitely want those big three. And Lori, if I'm missing one besides income statement, balance sheet, and payer mix, please speak up. You're correct, Patrick. And I think for our statutory authority, we'd want to have some understanding of capital plans and how they've, how they've changed, because I think that is a part of our statute. So we'd want to include something to that like, but we could slim down that portion of the guidance too to, to cover that piece, I believe. So personally, I would like to hear from the hospitals which pieces are the burdensome pieces, because I feel like we can guess at that, but it would be helpful to actually, un we may guess wrong. And I, you know, I can't, 
I don't know that my guess on that is going to be the right guess. So, you know, I think I think we've all really expressed a desire to uh, to simplify. And really, my request is, uh, you know, we need some concrete, actionable feedback on what simplify means to the people who are actually participating in the process. Because, quite frankly, we could take our best stab at it, and it may not feel meaningful to them. At which point. It, we won't have accomplished the goal. Um, I just want to clarify, when I su suggested a presumptive approval process, I was not thinking that the budget submission would be any less than for the other hospitals um, who are not trying to seek a waiver. So I, my assumption was that the budget submission would be complete and adaptive and the hospital budget, budget guidance would be complied with in terms of those appendices, all those tables. Um, but um, I will throw out there one component of the budget guidance that I thought might be moved to the sustainability planning process uh, was questions, I think it was three, four, and five around the value-based payment. So keeping a couple of them, the first two, uh, but then moving three, four, and five into the sustainability planning process where I think that may be more relevant as we're moving forward trying to plan for um, value-based payment. But other than that, my intent was that the full budget submission would still be done. It would be reviewed. Otherwise, how do you identify red flags or things that you might be worried about? Um, but if those parameters are met and the submission is complete, then we would waive the hearing. So I just wanted to clarify that was my intent when I brought it up. I agree with that, Jess. I was All I was saying is if there were specific requests about what we currently have in there that seem burdensome, that would be helpful because we may, you sure. know, it may be something that we would agree we could forego this year. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yes, I it should be the same submission across the board. And just to put on the record, the staff did meet with all the CFOs from around the state a couple weeks prior to this discussion. And so there has been an opportunity for feedback. If people haven't provided it, I don't think you can blame that on anything that's occurred from the staff's point of view. Oh, and I wasn't trying to, so I'm sorry if it came across that way. I wasn't trying to blame anybody. I was just saying for me personally, like I continue to hear a request for simplification. I don't know what that means. So having more con something more concrete would be helpful, that's all. So sorry, sorry, Patrick and Lori, I did not mean it. So I hope it didn't come across that way. No, it didn't. You you make a very valid point. Um, there is a bit of a difference between um, discussing budget guidance and then actually seeing what's being voted upon. So we would also welcome that from the hospitals for consideration. And I would just suggest that any comments of that nature be to us by the end of this week. so that people can fully um, assess it, vet it, and be prepared to discuss it next Wednesday at the board meeting. So the other thing I would chime in on, because I haven't really weighed in on the charge increase yet, um, is uh, I am probably higher than you are, Kevin, because I, I, what I, based on what, I'm hearing in sort of the uncertainty, my assumption, which may or may not be valid, is that a hospital may approach this year the same way that they approached last year, which for the most part was an assumption about kind of level on the utilization and looking to add stability through the charge. And so um, I would, I, I mean, I guess, right, now I would probably land at the 4% recommendation of the staff, understanding that there were seven hospitals that were above that. Um, and to Maureen's point, I think I was articulating last year concern about building it into the base, but it may be that we have a two year period where the base ends up being high because of the uncertainty related to COVID for, in order to err on the side of sustainability. And then it 
you know, it may kick it down the can, the can down the road for another year, which I'm not psyched about, but I just, with this level of uncertainty, I could sort of think that that may be the way that this year may look a lot like last year. I think this year may very well look a lot like last year. And, um, those are the arguments that I think you would hear at hearing why it might have to go above that. But to um, give a carte blanche presumptive approval to um, something that um, would increase the base over what the base was already increased last year, I think is creating uh, real systemic problems for the future of any type of sustainability for healthcare in the state. and. At that point, I, I would quickly come to the conclusion that um, this whole board is a waste of time for Vermonters, and Vermonters would be better served just by negotiations between insurers and the providers. And um, we are just uh, not adding any efficiency to the system, but that's a personal view. If we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, I might not I might not disagree with you. But I think I mean I still feel like this it may be longer than we wanted, obviously, but uh, you know, I think the board has shown its value pre-pandemic and I think that would continue post-pandemic. But I hear you, it's it's tough. And last year, um despite what the um uh, guidance was, we we allowed for variations and I think that the board has always shown a willingness to allow for, for variations based on the individual stories that are presented to us, but to give people a pass on the regulatory process at a, a high point just scares scares me. And I saw that Mike Del Treco had his hand up and I'm sure he'll tell me why I'm completely wrong. <laughs> Mike. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Mullen. I, I wouldn't do that, so. Uh, there, I mean, we just went through a pretty um, structured process of looking at NPR rate, and then we went to a, um, a, a dialogue that started to mesh a whole bunch of things together. Um, and it's a little bit difficult to uh, comment on all of those pieces. I'll just start uh, where I and where I think I uh, need to, and uh, my colleague Jeff and others might fill in if I if I miss something. Um, one is I would urge you not to vote on presumptive eligibility. We don't know what that means. How, how does enforcement work in 2022 with presumptive eligibility? All of those things, there's a lot there. Um, two, um, the discussion around uh, rate increase, um, it was mentioned on more than one occasion that um, rate increase impacts hospitals differently. There's critical access hospitals, there's PPS hospitals, there's hospitals with different payer mix, there's hospitals with different contracts um, and the like. I would recommend no ceiling on or no NPR rate increase and leave it as it has been in the past. Um, really important. I mean, these organizations are at a time and a crisis you've heard uh, about uh, meeting their margins. Um, and they need the opportunity to uh, to, to do so. Um, the other point that I would make here in this, uh, as you mentioned, this bifurcated rate, um, sure there was a bifurcated rate, but if you look at actual net patient service revenue in 2020, um, we all know that that was downed. The insurance companies did have not have one dollar of impact because of that bifurcated rate. So that's some, there's been no benefit and it would be very harmful to think about taking away from hospitals that receive CARES Act money um, be, uh, because of <clears throat> in the future because of um, a bifurcated rate conversation. Uh, Robin, to your point about simplicity um, into the discussion in the CFO group, um, there was one primary discussion that the CFO group had and it was specific to a rate table conversation. It was, there was not a whole lot of conversation specific to um, uh, uh, adaptive and, and all of those uh, pieces and parts. What we did, however, talk about um, with Patrick was what if that was um, uh, condensed and compressed a little bit and all the detail uh, was not necessary to be included. That is, that is a benefit that does help with uh, simplification in that process. 
Um, I myself, when I listen to CEOs and CFOs talk, and, I, and there's many on the phone, so if I misspeak, please let me know. I hear um, not about the loading into adaptive. I hear about the um, preparation. I hear about the questions. I hear about the uncertainty of the budget process that makes things challenge. I hear about um, uh, the, the multiple reason, multiple back and forth. I hear about the never ending deliberation um, and that they all have to be pre prepared for under oath, as you know. So those are the things that I would uh, ask you to think about when you um, are considering simplifying. Um, and then that's not a, um, that's how the process has worked. But those were, are the challenges that, that I've heard in the in the past. So um, hopefully that helps. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Steve Gordon. Great. Um, so I know I'm holding everyone up for getting their green beer today, but I do want to make a couple of um, comments. Um, you know, and I just got this information um, uh, early this morning, the presentation. So it's pretty hard for me to respond, you know, on the fly. And uh, I will do what we can to um, give you some specifics um, as a reaction to this um lengthy document that Patrick has put together. But I do want to address some of my concerns related to the, the uh, uh, Word document that's uh, listed as FY 2022 Hospital Budget Guidance and Reporting Requirements, effective March 31. And I don't know if you can bring that up, but um, I'll give you um, a concern that I have on page five. Um, under A, under net patient revenue fixed uh, prospective payment growth ceiling. Um, there's a section in here or one sentence that says, in connection with establishing a hospital's MPR FPP growth limit, the board may review and adjust the hospital's proposed operating expenses. I would suggest to you that I think this is a, a real overreach on, beha on behalf of the board, the Greenmount Care Board, is my board and individual hospital boards that are responsible for ultimately our budgets, um, especially as it relates to operating expenses. Um, and I went back in time and I didn't see this um, sentence in any of the other um, uh, uh, budget guidances that came out. So I would ask you to seriously give consideration of dropping that um, comment, especially as it relates to adjusting hospital proposed expenses. Um, that's a detail that we are responsible for working with our own individual boards. And I said, I, uh, in, in all due respect, I do think that's a bit of an overreach. The other, the other uh, comment I have, um, it's under C, but it's also kind of, kind of this whole um, focus on uh, financials, which I know are very important. But one of the things that has been left out of the discussions on sustainability, as well as our budgets, is our community health needs assessments. And I've shared this, Kevin, with you and others that we as hospitals respond to the huge amounts of needs in our local communities in Brattleboro, whether it's the homeless, whether it's setting up a dental program, all of those things have to be taken into consideration as we look at this. And that's why I think it's really important that at least that element of uh, the community health needs assessment and what are we doing within our own communities should be part and parcel of a budget process because we are spending a lot of money, rightly so, responding to the social economic um, challenges that our communities um, are under right now, especially as we go through um, this pandemic. So that's those are two comments I just have. We haven't really we haven't talked at all about you know this um, budget guidance word document. And I just wanted to share that because I looked at it very quickly. And those are the things that popped out directly at me. And I would hope that you take that into consideration. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Is there any other discussion from the board? Um, just just to comment, um, you know, to, to make one comment on Steve's comment, which is, um, as I recall, the wasn't the community health needs assessment. Part of that was moved out and put into non-financial at one point, and part of it was to help simplify the process. So 
if, if you want it back in and that's collectively what the group wants, you know, I don't think we would object to that, but I, you know, maybe it's optional, right? Because I, I think that was one, if I recall correctly, wasn't that one that we had, you know, put into the non-financial to try to simplify things and timing, but absolutely is very important and is why in many cases, the programs that you have support that. So I think I think I'm just trying to say that's a balance of you know what do we need to make this decision versus you know what what do we want to have when we talk about kind of the non-financial and things like that. So I would just you know with certain other yeah. re relevant factors they can definitely be in there, um, but that got taken out and put elsewhere um, well, for the right. reason. Yeah, I, I, I'm not advocating that it goes back in as a whole, but I'm just sharing with you, you know, these are some of the things that we are all addressing uh, in our local communities, which have a financial impact. And that's one of the things that we're going to, as we have every year, address in our, in our budget submissions. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, part of what we always talk about is really understanding, you know, the, the hospital and what's going on and telling the story, if you will, of your hospital. And so that is clearly a piece of it and you know I, I know we don't want to lose sight of that and um we kind of waive those things for now because of the uh you know because of some of the stuff with the pandemic but so maureen if i if i may address your and, and steve's discussion point here we we had settled on kind of a happy medium we recognized the <clears throat> importance of those documents we recognized the fact that it was stripped out of the off cycle or non-financial reporting to help alleviate that um, matter for this year. It was not collected last year. So to make good on that, we've got it here in the document on page 13 to collect it with the most recent 990 on September 30th. So it would be the community health needs assessment and or work plan um, to make sure we continue to collect it so the board is continually informed of um, the work those hospitals are doing. Other board comments or questions? I mean, I'm obviously more concerned about the issue of operating expenses and the board's uh, ability to do um, do an adjustment on individual operating expenses. Steve, I can tell you the history there is that for a number of years, a couple of your peers um, continued to put in budgets that um, were not realistic based on their performance and it, it showed that they had an operating margin, but it only showed because they had budgeted revenues um, to the point that um, were aspirational at best. And so um, the board rightfully called them on that and said, you really need to cut your expenses accordingly because without a margin, there isn't a mission. And so I think that uh, that was the intent here. Nobody on the board has a desire to micromanage your hospitals. Nobody on the board wants to tell you what line items um, need to be reduced. But I can tell you that um, creating a budget that looks good on paper, but only because you have a revenue target that you're never gonna reach doesn't help anyone. And maybe to add to that, Kevin, maybe there's a way that it could be rephrased in the document because you're right, in the orders, um, when we have brought down a couple of the hospitals that, um, one that maybe went into bankruptcy with, with budgets that were significantly high, and when we reduce them, we would say, you know, to reduce expenses commiserate with the reduction in the top line, really trying to keep that bottom line a positive operating margin. So, so maybe it can be linked to if there are adjustments to NPR, um, the board may, you know, again, it's a may 
you know, um, request that expenses are also reduced in order to maintain the operating margin, something like that. So, so Steve, I mean, it was it was very much in just a few cases, but um, when we, you know, it, for those hospitals, it would we would show repeatedly coming in for a ten percent or you know high increase, literally like ten percent. And then not hitting that and, you know, their expenses don't go down. And then the same thing happened the next year and the same thing happened the next year. So it was, it was again, trying to protect the financial of, of that hospital, of those hospitals. But, yeah, I don't think anyone wants to manage your expenses at that level. We'd welcome, Steve, if you could send us a letter with what you might uh – think an appropriate change to that language would be. Yeah, we'll do. You know, that's my general concern is I just got these all these documents yesterday or early this morning. So it's kind of hard to respond appropriately with a limited amount of time. Yep, understood. Um, Judy Fox. Sure. I know it's late and I'll be short, but um, and the board will not uh, find my comment new, but I invite you to think about other restrictions that hospitals uh, are, are facing. Um, it's not just guidelines and ceilings from the Green Mountain Care Board. As we take on more risk um, in ACOs um, and move into Medicare and Medicaid programs, as we publish our rates on our website uh, and have the challenge of uh, negotiating commercial contracts, those are all very real risks, and those happen day by day by day. Um, and so regardless of what net revenue caps or um, rate increases you are going to enforce on us, uh, we have a very real world challenge there. And I invite you not to forget that those challenges are there. So absent any guidance from the Green Mountain Care Board, we aren't at liberty to just go off and uh, raise rates and uh, turn the cheek on our expense structure. If we do that, uh, we will not succeed. And so please do not forget about those programs uh, that we are committed to and those um, you know, commercial and uh, contracts that um, we, we're gonna be forced to, to renegotiate. And I can tell you in Rutland, that's already happened. So. Um, not new, I know, but please uh, don't forget those limitations and challenges. Thank you, Judy. Is there any other comment from anyone from the board or elsewhere? Hearing none, um, Patrick, Laurie, Kate, thank you for the presentation today. Thank you for the hard work you've been doing over the last couple months to get us to where we're at today. I know it seems like we're a long ways away from the uh, finish line, but I think a lot has been accomplished today. And um, the most important thing I think is to have that uh, candid conversation with the hospitals in an open meeting so that everybody um, can understand where everybody is coming from. And so, um, I, I know that um, it would have been nicer if we could have made further progress on decisions, but the important thing is to make the right decisions. And again, for me, this is guidance. Um, this board has continually shown a willingness to move away from guidance at hearing, to listen to the individual stories, and each hospital has their own story to tell. And so um, as heated as some discussions may become at the end of the day i think everybody is on the same page we want a healthy health care system in the state of vermont so that every vermonter has access to quality care and um, that is the mission that we all share in common and again without a margin there isn't a mission and we understand that so is there any old business to come before the board at this time Is there any new business to come before the board at this time? 
under new business, I just want to have a discussion with the board in that I think that um, next Wednesday we could proceed and get everything done. But I just want to throw out there if there's any desire to um, start the meeting um, earlier in the day, say 10 o'clock in the morning, um, with a chance that uh, if um, things do get messy and rough and we need some time to think over the lunch hour, we can come back to it in the afternoon and try to make uh, the proper decisions. Um, the goal here is to have the uh, guidance out by uh, March 31st. And um, so is there any interest by any board members to start any earlier or would you prefer to, to stick with the one o'clock time frame? I'm fine with starting earlier, Kevin. I'm yeah, I, I, oh, <laughs> I, um, I think it's your call, Kevin. I, I'm open to it. I'm open to it. Just don't want it to just we don't want to then be from 10 to 4 because we have extra time. <laughs> you know, it's almost like if you have the 1 to 4, we might get it done. If we have a 10, if we have that window, it probably will go to 4. But so actually, Maureen, I was thinking of a certain person on the board who might have a birthday next <laughs> Wednesday and she might want to start celebrating before 4. So I thought starting at 10 might actually be helpful. And give that Mike, person. I wanted to ski, but that's not going to happen. So, <laughs> Robin, I know you started to say something. No, I was just saying I'm flexible. Um, there's a small chance a legislative committee might be taking up a report next week, but I think we could request that they do that at nine if needed, to, if it had to be on Wednesday. But I think we should just go ahead because that's not scheduled yet. So I'm going to use the prerogative of the chair and set the meeting time for 10 a.m. next Wednesday. Um, and is there anything else for new business to come before the board? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed uh, signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone. Happy St. Patrick's Day. And I can't remember who offered the green beer, if it was Steve Gordon. I only wish we could take you up on that. It's a, It was a strange St. Patrick's Day last year, and it's definitely going to be an even stranger one this year. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. May the luck of the Irish be with everyone today. <laughs>